Okay, yeah, so okay, yeah, higher tone. I'll just switch to this a bit that, okay. And it seems we are also live on YouTube, so behave. <laughs> we will. <laughs> Okay, so we're, I think Vladimir is still missing. And that's it. Or we can, uh, when is the official start? Is that, is two that? Minutes. In, in two minutes. two minutes. Okay, okay. Then is that a hotel room? Yep. Okay. I hope that the internet coverage will be fine. Yeah. It seems that it seems that there, no, no one is uh, is lagging. Well, we'll see. Okay, so in one minute we will begin. I, I, I'm not sure if the audience can you know see us and hear us right. Uh, or will we wait for the for other panels uh, to somehow stop? Yes, they can hear us and see you well, so you can start. And Vladimir ah. will probably join in the meantime. Ah, okay, good. So basically, we're uh, practically all set. Uh, very, very nice. Uh, really, really nice that we're on time. Uh, hi, everybody. And let's talk about Ukraine. The majority of, of us except of me and most probably except of me and Danis, are uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian nationals, uh, or representing uh, local Ukrainian businesses, or um, let's say focusing uh, on Ukraine as one of the key markets uh, for the uh, very early future, uh, near future. So um, let's begin with the introduction of everybody. I'll just tell the, the name and the company and you can go forward with a short uh, introduction of yourself. So let's start with uh, Denis Niedra because he's the first one from my side to the, to the right, uh, from NLabs. Uh, yeah, so introduce yourself a bit and um, let's say, tell me more um, about but why are you in this panel? Because you haven't been, uh, your your optimist basically, or NLAPS hasn't been in, in Ukraine since, you know, um, earlier. So please do so right now. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrews. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Andrews. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, but you decided to start with a guy who doesn't represent Ukraine by the nationality or like by the business. Yeah, we, as NLAPS, we don't have like significant revenues coming from the Ukraine now but uh, as a part of our future and uh, like the long-term strategy we share with our like shareholders and uh, what we share publicly we see ourselves only in the regulated markets and now 95 percent of our revenues coming from the regulated markets yes yeah, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, Sweden yeah so uh, we last year we decided to enter Belarus. Everything is ready there, with the exception of the IT. And uh, the logical step in our future uh, development to enter the the next regulated market, which is Ukraine. Yeah, that's challenging. Yeah, we're not like going to uh, be like top three company from the start, but with the small steps, uh, we will try to cut the big uh, slice of the pie of the UK Ukrainian license online gaming market 
Okay. Yeah. So as you as you might know, yeah, we're number one in Baltics. We're, uh, we're like quite quite the quite big leader there in terms of the online gaming with our flagship brand Optibet. But uh, now we're launching more new brands and uh, we're more like online casino company in either the betting. Okay, understood. So uh, thanks a lot. And I have uh, Evgenia Derbat who doesn't want you to slice a big <laughs> slice of pie <laughs> in Ukraine. We do. <laughs> Hi, Hi Evgenia. Uh, she represents Pari Match, which, uh, which, which has quite big roots, quite you know, quite extensive roots in Ukraine. So please introduce yourself shortly, uh, briefly, and, and yeah, very nice to see you. Yes, hello everyone. Hello, Andrew. Thank you very much for introduction. Well, since our brand was originally established in Ukraine in 1994, uh, but being an international company, of course, we are really much interested in Ukrainian market and keep an eye on the legalization process. Now we are holding license this in a number of countries, including Kazakhstan, Belarus, uh, then um, Tajikistan and Cyprus. And our brand is also represented in a number of countries under franchise agreements, uh, for example, in uh, Tanzania and Russian Federation. So yes, we are interested a lot and uh, we um, definitely keep an eye on what is going on in Ukraine. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, now, uh, moving to Sergei Romanenko, you're, you're, you're an operator too. Uh, it's the, the majority of us, um, except of the lawyers, except of the, the, of, the, of the attorneys, are operators here in, the, in this panel, but you're an, a, a bit of a different operator than, than, everyone, else, than everyone else. You're a, a, a Poker Network representative. So please introduce yourself and your interest in, in, in Ukraine, apart from that you're yourself Ukrainian. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Sergi. I represent uh, CIS office of uh, Gigi Poker. Uh, Gigi Poker for now is one of the, I think, two largest uh, poker sites in the world. And uh, we are working uh, around all the world. Uh, we have a license, a UKGC license, we have MGA uh, license, uh, and uh, we are thinking to have a license in Ukraine. And uh, I'm living, I'm from Ukraine, I'm living in Ukraine, and uh, because of this, uh, thanks uh, Zoltan, I take part in this conference. Okay. And uh, I will answer for the questions about uh, the poker. Okay, um, and I think uh, we have uh, Artem Kuzmenko, who is an attorney, a, a Ukrainian attorney with in-depth information and knowledge and experience in gambling uh, legislation, uh, 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 drafting of the, uh, the, the legislation itself. And I think he is currently the last panelist on, on the list because Vladimir is still not with us. Uh, so hi, Artem. Let's try if if you're live. Yeah, you're live. Uh, hello, 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 everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, why I'm here? Because uh, uh, because our company uh, was involved in uh, law development process, and uh, actually, uh, personally, I work with Parliament and. Uh, uh we know a lot about uh, ukrainian uh, gambling law and uh, i think i will uh, tell uh, some details uh, how it will be and uh, what we have now in ukraine with uh, 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 legislation Okay, great. And I see that we we already have Vladimir uh, Malak Malakchit. So uh, hi. Uh, you should un unmute yourself. Introduce yourself a bit. You're a, you're a, I think you're you're the only real B two B representative here in the panel, uh, because all others are the operators or semi operators, semi B two Bs, and you're the only real B two B. So really nice to have you here. Introduce yourself very briefly, and let's go uh, speaking about the logistics framework. Hi. Hi guys. Nice to meet you all. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we are uh, the only one, not, 
with uh, in Ukraine from B2B, B2B who is uh, participating in different conferences as well. And uh, I think my, my main goal is to provide to people like B2B approach on Ukrainian market uh, after receiving the full information about licenses, about how to move forward with the operators, what should be from marketing strategy, from business point of view. So I hope to, to provide as uh, much possible, as much information as possible. Okay, thanks a lot. So let's begin. We, we took only eight minutes, that's perfect. So let, let's begin with what's going on in, in uh, Ukraine right now, because I think all uh, the, the audience knows that it, it was a long journey for the, for the gambling act to, to come into uh, the stage that it's right now. So um, let's, let's skip the, that long journey and let's talk about where are we at currently. And I think uh, the most you know, um, knowledgeable people here to talk about the uh, legislative fr framework uh, are two lawyers, so uh, Evgenia and Artyom. Can you please introduce one from the, from, as an external um, service provider, legal service provider, and one as an in-house uh, of the information and struggles may, may be that uh, a, a, an operator, a future operator has or had uh, up and, until now, and some sort of, um, let's say, Mm, inside information of what could we expect in the near future from the secondary legislation perspective, which we still lack, uh, in particular the technical uh, technical um, portion of the secondary legislation, the, the monitoring system when it's going to be launched, uh, and uh, not 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 even speaking about the tax uh, framework, which never nobody knows which which route will go. So, um, Artem, and, uh, Artem, could you please uh, go forward uh, about introducing what's currently there and uh, what's happening today, basically? Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I would say uh, a few words about the history of the process. Uh, this uh, uh, will help to understand how the market will develop. Uh, so, uh, how it was, <laughs> as you said, uh, uh, it was damn hard. Uh, the process of preparing the bill began uh, more than uh, one and a half year ago. And I took part in this process from the very beginning. We worked uh, with parliament, with, with experts, uh, uh, and more than uh, 3,500 amendments were submitted to the bill before the second reading. So it was a really difficult process. and. Uh, a lot uh, has changed during this, this time, but the main goal was to develop such a law that would allow the market to, to be launched quickly. And I believe that uh, we succeed. Sometimes many requirements for operators and equipment are simpler than in other jurisdictions, but still uh, we have uh, uh, some difficulties. So. Uh, as I said, uh, the main idea was to start market as fast as possible. And uh, this position uh, will have an impact on all future processes. For now, we have uh, the following situation. Uh, Gambling Commission was created last week. Uh, in, in the next few days, uh, we will be announced and competition to elect members of the Gambling Commission. And it should take, uh, I think, two more, two, two, two more weeks. In parallel, the Commission for Preparation of Biowals uh, is working. Uh, so I can say that everything in, in progress. Uh, but as we know for now, uh, uh, from the cabinet of ministers, the process of approving license conditions may take longer than previously uh, we seen. So um, it uh, still may be some delay, and the license application process may begin in uh, late November, early December. 
Okay, and so, Yevgeny, how do you see that uh, this process? Do you do you, do you share the same thoughts that uh, you know it was written in the manner uh, for the for the industry to go uh, live as soon as possible? Is there enough clarity for let's say for international players or the local players? Let's say what what there you know are they eligible to to enter the market? What's what's actually the costs behind that? I'm not speaking about the taxes, but you know. My clients are always like, you know, uh, okay, so could you could you assist on you know in entering the Ukrainian market because we can't really count how much you know will it cost us you know the, the annual costs the the, the, the licensing fees uh, is that you know um, a, a, a final uh, sum or it's a, a intermediary uh, sum or you know some similar stuff. So um, Evgeny, how do you see that process? Is that a, a smooth process? Um, not take, not not talking about that long journey, but right now, or do you see you know too much unclarity until now? Thank you. Well, I would agree with uh, you, Andreas and Artem, that it's uh, not totally clear picture in terms of the current law, and we definitely need the secondary legislation to to have answers to some questions, uh, which we should wait for two or three months. Uh, if I understood correctly. And in terms of the law itself, as far as I know, there should be initiatives in order to amend the uh, law, which was already signed by the president, it came into force. For example, in order to avoid discrepancies in terms of the election of the members of uh, the commission. Uh, and um, for us, uh, the important uh, matter here is also the changing of the tax legislation. And I'm sure it's not only for us, but for each and every player uh, in the market. Because as for now, the tax burden is huge. It's 80% corporate profit tax, 80% tax on GGR, 80% personal in income tax. And you also have this uh, defense contribution being 1.5. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are four bills already registered at the parliament in order to make changes to the tax code, but uh, uh, there were no first hearings so far, and since the parliament uh, was closed due to the COVID until October 20, it's really good question when the parliament could start uh, review the draft and make decision how to change the tax system of uh, gambling. But I must admit that the process is moving and uh, we, um, we do see the changes almost uh, like every, every week. Uh, as Artem mentioned, within two weeks, we will have the, the commission, which can start uh, developing the secondary legislation, take decisions, and uh, the industry will understand the clear rules for the industry. Yeah. That's a very interesting uh, uh, part I wanted to touch base because um, it's not always, um, you know, that first importance that the, the gambling commission has been formed. Like, you know, it's a, for, for, the, for the industry uh, in, in the majority of cases, it's not, you know, that important. Okay, we have to have a, a regulator and that's it. But so what kind of powers will the regulator have? Is that a, a, a only an enforcer? of the uh, uh, primary and secondary legislation, or it will have the power to decide upon the restrictions of the, of the, of the products that can enter the market or the restrictions of, of other sorts of you know, service um, uh, testing requirements and stuff like that. What's, you know, what's the weight of that uh, commission? Because the fuss is big. Yeah, it's, um, it's yeah, Artem, go ahead. You can share. Okay. Uh, Artem, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a really, really good question because uh, everybody now uh, looking for this. And we know uh, I want to uh, maybe answer in, in more detail and, and cover also, also uh, bio laws that uh, everybody waiting. And uh, we know that many uh, operators are waiting for second uh, uh, regulations such as uh, license terms and conditions on the gaming commission and online monitoring system so on uh, because uh, uh, some of them think that uh, in uh, thus this uh, second regulation uh, can be something uh, critical for business 
but in practice as we see and as we know uh we don't expect any sur any, any surprises from by laws uh because uh, uh there was a big fight over the um, provisions of the law in parliament and we understood that uh, uh the same fight could be about the provisions of the bylaws therefore the basic logic of the law is that bylaws may contain only technical provisions for example uh, license terms will contain mainly the forms of documents required to obtain a license uh, for example i don't know license application form I think, but that's I think, also the most crucial thing for, but yeah but I, I i believe that it is the most crucial thing for let's say um uh, sergey and vladimir because they, they can't they can't even start uh, the you know um testing the uh, the products in accordance to the requirements set by the or commission or the or the legislature of the ukrainian uh, yeah Yes, agree. And, and and the same approach to the powers of uh, uh, gambling commission, uh, because they cannot be expanded by 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 the by laws. So uh, everything uh, what we have in the law is the main uh, main thing that uh, all uh, operators should uh, uh, read now and. Uh, uh, second regulation will be only technical and uh, we already have example because uh, 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 regulation uh, which uh, uh, was adopted but uh, by the cabinet of minister uh, uh, last week uh, it connected to the gambling commission and uh, we didn't see any surprises everything in the law Okay, good. Good to know. Good to hear. Good to know. And and that the expectations in in in, in very near future, like in a month or, or two, are really decent. So um, let's move to Dynis because uh, you mentioned okay, you're you're number one in 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 the Baltics or the biggest or the the the, 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 the yep. you mentioned number one. So um, so is that like you know going south and that's it? The Baltics and you know. Uh, Belarus, then what's there? Okay, so it's Ukraine, or is it somehow you know picking the markets one by one, like carefully? Why Ukraine, and you know how you, is that? It, it, do you, do you feel your brand it will for some reason be attractive to Ukrainians, or you see Ukraine as a very very, let's say, promising market for size, for for profitability and stuff like that. What's what's there? What's behind? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, about regarding the brand, for now it's not like the the core topic within like the discussions we have internally in the group. Yeah, so we have like uh, multiple strategies in regards of the product and the brand we we're gonna launch in the Ukrainian market. It will be like one brand uh, as a one-stop shop as Optibet, or it will be multiple brands under different licenses. Yeah, but in general. Answering your question, uh, yeah, so we see a potential there. Yeah, maybe it's not the source of the revenues for the next year or for 2022, but we have a longer strategy up to 2025. Yeah, so we see a potential. The market will will be like, it will not be fully transparent and predictable from day one, but soon or later it will uh, be more, let's say, uh, we look more as, as as any other regulated market, yeah. And comparing to the Russia, Kazakhstan, or any other markets for us was important to have casino product as a, as a licensed product, yeah. So that's what Ukraine can can give us. Okay, but that's that's uh, you know one of the markets where you can't really you know answer with empty pockets. Basically, it's it's not something like you know a, a very small market or relatively. Uh, unknown, you know, it's going to be a very, let's say, important market or interesting market for many international players, which will join, uh, you know, from the very start, or from the very beginning or, or, or later. Uh, it's a big market. It's a bit, you know, from, from considering the size um, and and similar stuff. So, are you are you thinking of, you know, Ukraine as a hub 
for the uh, CIS or, or you know, uh, building up a, 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 you know, an office there, uh, you know, to be live or just, you know, one of the, one of the uh, remote areas and that's it. Yeah, uh, yeah, we consider, so we're trying to have more or less same setup in all the offices we have across the, the markets we, we have a business, but yeah, Ukraine could be become a potential hub for IT support and other centralized resources we have, yeah. So the idea was to, to set this hub in Minsk, but uh, according to the current situation, maybe it's better and faster to, to set and start oh, yeah. if or, or any other Ukrainian city. Okay, understood. Um, Andreas, can, can I add a comment in yes, terms of? Sure, sure. Um, Maybe about you the, might... uh, the comment about the empty pockets, empty pockets most probably. <laughs> no. <Sure. laughs> well, in terms of the IT hub that can be uh, established here in Ukraine, uh, you might know that uh, there is an initiative called Dear City. Okay. Uh, supported yeah, yeah, okay. by the office of the president and it's a like, really good initiative to build up a special zone in Ukraine to support IT with all the privileges in terms of the corporate, corporate compliance and taxes of course. So please take a look uh, uh, on Ukraine from, from this perspective as well. It is not only it is not only about legal points uh, of creation. This for gambling industry, we we should always uh, remember that Ukraine is nice uh, uh, place for tourists and a lot of tourists from different countries around CS, not from only CS included, uh, past CS like Poland, for example, uh, even Turkey, you know, Kazakhstan, and uh, even Georgia. They they are just coming here and uh, a lot of different tourists. They they would like to have an opportunity to play here. Uh, I, I'm just speaking mostly about offline offline opportunities. Plus, uh, if uh, what what, just, what what we see in the U.S. market, for example, that uh, people have to play in, on, on some offline casinos. They're always trying to, to continue playing in some online models. That's why even U.S. Uh, with their strong restrictions about online gambling, they even trying to push it because people asking about this. We should always should think about the audience first of all, and I'm sure that after opening, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 or 500 casinos around Ukraine and tourists will start play, playing this. Uh, after this, they will uh, have a wish to play on their mobile. And that's why we should, uh, we should have this opportunity. It is a yeah. big amount. It is, it is a poss possible big amount of money for our budgets inside country. And I'm sure that even, for example, in compare to Finland, so they have only 5 million more players. Yeah, their uh, income is higher than the, in Ukraine, of course. I mean, average income. Uh, but uh, they have uh, average uh, income from gambling around $3 billion per year. It's just pretty nice for 5 million people only. And we have more than 40 million people here. And it is a really potential great market, even from size, even from money size. We have a lot of, we have average low income, but we have a lot of uh, like uh, uh, whales, like called in gambling, in, in gambling niche. And I'm sure that uh, this market for not like uh, Dennis told, not for the first year, not even for the second year, but after people will, uh, mm, how to tell it correctly, will start understanding that there is no opportunity to play illegal. It is better to play from legally because it is safer for you. And they will move on. Yep, I, I am sure that after three, four, five years, they will move to this niche and this market will, will become only like sweeter. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot because you, you, touched, you touched a very important thing about uh, the, uh, the land base basically because we rarely touch land base during these panels because uh, the, most of the most of the guys are here from the from the from the online perspective, but yeah, you're right, you're right. And I don't know, uh, as far as I understand, you don't really do much about uh, land based yourselves. Uh, we're not providing land based ourselves, but uh, it doesn't mean that we're not uh, thinking about uh, you know techn technological uh, technologies uh, growing up and just upgrading every every day. And I'm sure that uh, after some period of time, maybe it will be even next year, uh, opportunity to integrate of such integrations. But I'm sure that jumping 
uh, to technological age. Uh, so um, Evil Play Entertainment is pos positioning uh, ourselves as so one of the most technological companies. We'll find an opportunity to integrate inside machines our web version of the games. And so once it's come, we will come to land based. But why need like a part of entertainment inside their home? They, they're just taking their mobile or laptop or PC around 80% of your and they're taking only mobile. And then they come to, to play uh, casinos inside, inside online niche. That's why I'm sure that uh, all the providers should start, start thinking about uh, implementing their games inside offline because it, it is a really great jump in uh, among brand developers for this audience and also in Ukraine. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Anthony. It's a very interesting uh, touch into, into this portion. Um, Sergey, how's stuff? <laughs> it's very interesting discussion. <laughs> How's poker do? How's poker do? Um, good. So um, please uh, let us know about your basically, you know, struggles and good stuff um, in Ukraine uh, in terms of poker. Because you know, um, all of the guys are here, like a broad perspective uh, operators, uh, like you know, betting plus casino, like you know, not a very very oriented. A, 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 a product oriented operators while you're a single product oriented operator which is very interesting but you know how do you see the legislation from a single product side it doesn't have any flaws uh, the international liquidity how's how's this portion doing is it somehow mentioned in the in the gambling act will it be mentioned in the secondary legislation about the uh, uh, international liquidity is it going to be uh, uh, you know, a, a discussion to, dis to be decided by the commission itself, which is in all cases, in all the jurisdictions, the, the worst thing possible to leave this to the, to the regulator for, to decide on their own. So what, what do you see it, um, for the poker in Ukraine? Because it's going to be uh, most probably a big market. Uh, I think in GG Poker, we think that uh, Ukrainian government uh, with Artyom uh, made a good job. Uh, it's a uh, good law for the poker. Uh, we, uh, we hope, uh, previously we hoped that it will be more about poker because uh, we can't uh, find in this law uh, the regulation of uh, live, uh, ser live poker series. But uh, generally, this uh, law is okay. Um, as uh, my colleagues uh, mentioned before, we, also, uh, we are also waiting for the more clear... Uh, more clear uh, politics uh, from uh, the government, uh, because, uh, especially in uh, tax uh, in tax policy. Mm -hmm. um, for now, it's uh, the main uh, the main issue. So it's thing which we don't understand. Uh, in the future, we are a little bit worried uh, because uh, because of. Uh, as I, as I told before, because there is no policy about uh, live poker tournaments, because it's very good marketing tool. Also, for now, it's unclear with uh, uh, te uh, te technical requirements uh, uh, with online monitoring system. So it's... Uh, the, I think it's uh, the main bullet uh, which we are thinking about. Generally, I hope uh, that the poker, uh, it's uh, the game of skill. And uh, previously, 10 years ago, it was uh, very popular uh, in Ukraine. Uh, there are a lot of uh, famous uh, uh, poker, uh, poker players in Ukraine. And uh, we hope it will, it, Ukraine will be a very interesting market uh, for the poker companies too. Okay, and so, so it's good to hear actually. I, to be honest, I, I, I knew that it's quite good for poker, but it was 
quite good for poker in Ukraine earlier in, in historically too, because I think you were the first ones to have the, the federation of the sport poker and stuff like that. So it's, you have the big, you know, high and deep roots in, 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 uh, of poker in Ukraine. But um, so you yourselves, um, do you focus, obviously you focus on, on online thing. Um, uh, Vladimir mentioned the, the land-based uh, possibilities and Ukraine most probably ha will have the, the land-based possibilities. Will you be doing something land-based or not? Um, no, GG Poker is a 100% uh, online uh, project. Yeah, I know, so, I know. so we are not. Sorry. Uh, so, but uh, it's a very good uh, um, tool for marketing is uh, to make uh, life uh, poker serious. And uh, back to your previous question, I, I forget to answer about. Uh, uh, the law uh, about uh, gambling law according to the poker. Uh, so for now, government uh, doesn't ask to have uh, country liquidity for poker. So we can uh, we can give opportunity for Ukrainian uh, clients uh, to give uh, to play with uh, the uh, poker players uh, around the world. Okay, but that's 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 a fantastic news actually. But is it something that you uh, don't want anybody to you know to raise the question because if you know this question will be raised, it will uh, uh, let's say uh, cause more fuss in terms of uh, the taxation and everything else. And you just expect that it's going to be you know smoothly not mentioned and that's it. Or you think that the government um, let's say understood, knew this issue, or not, let's not call it an issue, let's say this question, and they deliberately decided to not ring fence Ukraine uh, for poker, and let's say the bonuses and, 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 and the, the pools and stuff like that. Do you think it, it was a deliberate decision by the legislator, or maybe maybe even uh, Atom can answer that? Do you, did you take into account this question uh, when mentioning, not mentioning the ring, ring fencing, uh, or you did, you just did not think about that at all? Uh, uh, okay, uh, sorry, I, I'm sure that I uh, get uh, your question uh, correctly because of uh, connection <laughs> issue, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a good decision from the government to uh, to uh, make uh, ring fenced uh, liquidity, because uh, from uh, experience of uh, Spain, Italy, uh, France, uh, it's not uh, good for, first of all for the clients, and uh, in this uh, then it's international liquidity. The clients uh, have. Uh, bigger possibility about the bonuses, about the big tournaments, uh, uh, big price pools. pools. So I think uh, uh, according to the poker, uh, poker side, I think it's, uh, it, it's a good job from the Ukrainian government. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, for this. Uh, now, um, Vladimir, you were speaking about uh, Ukraine as, you know, as basically when I heard that, you know, you like your own country, <laughs> that's what I heard. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, for your company, is Ukraine uh, uh, relatively important country as a market? Or is it like, you know, your, your, your basis um, to go, you know, worldwide? I think uh, just from the business point of view, every country that have an opportunity to uh, to for players to play legally is important for our comp for our company and yeah Ukraine was in our uh, business strategy and it is a great part of it uh, but uh, as uh, as we already understand it is not about strategy for one or two years it is just a long term strategy long term discussion long term game and uh, it is very important for for our company from business point of view because we can uh, 
we understand this audience and so we try to create all the products focusing for different markets because different markets are playing different. For example, Finland is mostly focused on slots and uh, Belgium is mostly focused on dice, dice games and this is pretty different market and you can't just take one product and come to every market with, the, with its own. And uh, once being uh, Ukrainian ourselves and understand the local uh, local players, we, we can create uh, special products for them and then what will be more engaging, more retention. And from this point of view, uh, we are very interested in this market. And uh, we dreamt about this. It's it's always good to, to work in the market where your your niche is fully legal. I think it's it's a dream of every company in, uh, around the world. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Now, uh, moving, um, moving forward in terms of what uh, Danis mentioned, like uh, maybe it's not going to be, uh, let's say, that transparent from the uh, day one uh, as a market. Um, what, let's say, uh, issues are there with the monitoring system and what kind of, you know, unclarity we still have uh, for, the, for the near or long future? Uh, in terms of, um, you know, expenditure and entry into the market. Because I, I remember speaking with you um, about, you know, that the, the, the fees are relatively high, considerably. And uh, as far as the monitoring system is, you know, is going to be launched, nobody knows when. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, what, 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 uh, what you know, what views do you have on that? And what expectations do you have on that date? I'm in the position well, of the guy. Who, <laughs> you ask me, right? Or? Yes, yes, yes. yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. I'm yes. the position of the guy here who, is, who will not answer the question, who will ask the question. Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. more so question we, to, to Evgenia, I believe. Yeah, but uh, again, all these high taxes and the law, have, how it's written. We have that. How, yeah. The how how law is written, especially like this triple taxes before the monitoring system will be live, it it makes some preferences for the big established brands with the high brand awareness, like party much and so on. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's that's a bit tricky case here, and uh, yeah, that's like these are the things which the the foreign companies are want to be clarified as soon as possible. Yeah, besides the like in general the taxes law. And so I would. Please. Yeah, and Andreas, I would also uh, add uh, that uh, this uh, issue should be divided into two. So we have uh, uh, internal online monitoring system of uh, the operator and we have the uh, state monitoring system. In terms of the first one, for, for us, for all operators, are uh, really important that this system should be certified and the commission should uh, approve the list of local and international centers that can certify this system. Uh, being the software itself. As for now, we do not have any clarity. So it's really like uh, difficult to estimate your costs and uh, make the clear business plan for the upcoming year. And in terms of the state monitoring system, Ar Artem will correct me, but I've heard that uh, there were initiative to develop one within three months starting from last week, I presume. But this matter is really painful for the government because you need lots of resources and uh, uh, people, developments, uh, financial resources in order to implement one. And it will definitely be more than three months time. It, it will take years. And, and uh, before this system is implemented, there cannot be tax on GGR by, just by nature. Well, what, why? Because there are, you know, self-declaratory, um, let's say, uh, uh, regimes everywhere, like except of maybe Italy, Belarus, and stuff. So, you know, in, in the majority of, of jurisdictions, it's self-declaratory, and you pay taxes. Yeah, I, I, I understand your point, but it's it's a tricky question. Uh, was it good to launch uh, the regime itself without it? with only a promise that it's going to be there in the future. Um, yeah, it, it, it is a tricky question, even though, you know, like Belarus, they already had that prior to launching the new regime, um, which 
Um, rarely Belarus is ahead of themselves, but uh, in this particular time, they, they already they, they moved, uh, let's say, faster than, than, than their new gambling regime. Yeah, but that's that's a tricky tricky question. I understand why the why the industry is lacking clarity on that. Yeah, but it's not on the operator side. It's still on the government to do that. It's not even on the legislators' part. It's still it's it's another it's another question for the for the for the, for the government to to go forward with that. Uh, let's discuss okay. now. Yeah, so, yeah. If may, you have may, may, yes, may may I add some comments to on online monitoring system. Uh, the main idea was uh, that uh, uh, I, I want to tell about why we have tripled the uh, uh, license fee before monitoring system. Because uh, the main idea was that uh, tax authority uh, never work with uh, GGR. So uh, for, to, to control the taxes, they need the online monitoring system. And uh, before online monitoring system, uh, nobody should pay GGR and only uh, tripled license fee for uh, some uh, for some licenses. So uh, it, it's uh, very simple uh, in our uh, legislation. But uh, about uh, the monitoring system, uh, it's a really difficult issue. And uh, Evgenia says says that. Uh, uh, it will be in three, in three months. I don't think so, because uh, a law provides very strict requirements for the monitoring system, and it will be quite complicated. Therefore, its creation uh, requires serious uh, finding, and uh, in, in our opinion, it may take really a long time. So... Uh, we will see, but I think it will be really hard process. And uh, uh, now we have in the law that monitoring system should be uh, created in two, in, two year, in two years. So I think uh, uh, we need all this time uh, to create it. Because uh, we're not a rich country and uh, our government don't want to invest a lot of money for for this uh, in this process for creating uh online monitoring system so i think uh it will be pretty hard okay understood so um actually my, my last question i'm interested like personally so um no uh, the majority of the ju uh, the jurisdictions does not does not even have the online monitoring system at all and they don't have problems with that so but um, in terms of the monitoring system uh, in Ukraine, for the regular business, non-gambling business, are there you know, um, similar online monitoring systems in place? I think for no. the bar, for the restaurant, for whatever. Or is it like you know, a gambling specific requirement that you already foreseen that it's going to be a bit of a problem to count the taxes on themselves? So just, you know, let's put the, the online monitoring system for them. Is it a regular regular practice in Ukraine to have for the regular business or not? Actually, no. It was an idea from uh, some guys from working group uh, because uh, uh, people in Ukraine uh, don't want gambling in Ukraine. Uh, uh, we have uh, more than... 70 percent people that say no we don't want gambling in ukraine but uh, it's uh, maybe not correct but still it, it was really hard process and uh, uh, a lot of politics uh, uh, from uh, different parties say that okay we also don't want gambling in ukraine and as i said it was a big fight so one guy from working group said okay if uh, uh, if uh, people don't want, let's show them uh, that everything be controlled and let's create monitoring system and uh, uh, so everybody will pay taxes and we will be, we will have um, legal market and everything will be controlled. Uh, and uh, I think uh, maybe it's a good idea, maybe not, we will see. 
but uh, I know for sure that uh, it will be a really hard process to create it because, uh, uh, as I said, it's uh, really it will be really complicated system and it, it need uh, a lot of funds to create it or, or just okay. buy it. So, so thanks a lot because that's a very interesting, important and so um, we still have 25 minutes and I want to touch uh, three important uh, topics briefly but let's say uh, in you know condensated manner. Um, products, do you like any products uh, or there are some sort of restrictions there for some some particular products like basically you know, live dealer or non RNG uh, based products or uh, lottery similar to lottery products. This thing, then another thing is the um, um, marketing, advertising and marketing. And do you see a potential? For uh, controlling the non-regulated portion, basically the non-non-licensed uh, operators, uh, which will, you know, obviously target Ukraine. So, starting from um, the perspective of uh, uh, products, okay, live dealer, is it allowed? Uh, then let's say the the portion which is uh, very very um, important and becoming very important is the, the fantasy and esports stuff plus the loot boxes related thing because it, we are you know uh, merging a bit with video games in some portion um, yeah live dealer which is very uh, interesting for everybody plus live dealer and the betting on live events uh, balance in this perspective uh, and I don't think that any other products could be restricted in Ukraine. So uh, could most probably, could Yevgenia maybe comment a bit on that, on the uh, Sure. In, in terms of uh, the event that you can bet on, for us what was really important to, um, to figure out that the virtual events you cannot bet on, obviously, due to their um, law prescription and yeah. you can bet only to the real events. Uh, so the question we had, uh, how can we treat uh, virtual events and uh, fantasy sports and esports? Um, can we take bets on or shall we consider them as casino product and are they suitable for online casino? And can we consider fantasy and esports as a kind of slot machines for online casino products? Uh, what else? Uh, we have looked at uh, possibility to bet on some uh, products which uh, have elements of lottery. And mm. the law said that you cannot do this uh, uh, except you obtain the separate license. Uh, so all products that have elements of lottery are prohibited, but the law doesn't say what, what are these elements to be considered as being like part of the lottery. Okay. So this is also really important. Maybe it will be figured out at the level of the secondary legislation. Okay, so, so what, what do you decide? So what, 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 what uh, let's say, assumptions have you made uh, upon the, let's say, the fantasy stuff, the, 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 the virtuals, the, these kind of things. So. Do you need you know, uh, some sort of uh, thoughts from the regulator or you already know that all of these will pass as casino products? Well, in terms of the uh, law, we would consider the fantasy and esports products at the casino. Okay. Uh, well, uh, there is... can, can, I, can, can, yeah. can I correct? I think yeah. e-sport it will be betting product because uh, it's not something virtual. It's uh, real persons yeah. which are playing in, 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 in real place. And oh. it was an idea uh, that uh, uh, we understood in working groups that uh, it's a big market. And uh, I think we, we need to see how, how we'll see in Gambling Commission. But in my, in my opinion, uh, e-sport will be allowed for, for betting uh, 
uh, and other will show uh, products uh, uh, they can be only i think uh, uh, casino products nice. it really, me if I, it, yeah uh, so, really sorry, depends Dina. on the type of the e-sport okay sure okay Vladimir. Uh, yeah, sorry, correct me, guys. Uh, Artem and Evgeny mostly, I think. Uh, but uh, as I remember, uh, esports was uh, announced in Ukraine like uh, real events fully. Yes. Some something around one month ago. So, it's, yeah. uh, I, I think it's fully, fully better in product. Like nothing, comp nothing compared to virtual sports. It's just real, real event with real betting. And uh, yes. I, I'm just just curious about uh, these these kind of sports uh, from from myself. And I was pretty pretty happy that we are going to build some cyber cyber awareness in, in Ukraine. So I think it will be fully betting. There there won't be a yeah, yeah. for this. Sure, as I mentioned, it really depends on the type of the product. So some of the events we consider the online casino, and uh, yeah, totally agree that uh, the the real esport that uh, the people. Are deeply involved in and participate. It's real event that you can bet on and consider it as betting. Okay, so um, good. So uh, uh, let's say, and, and, and this bet on live event, do you have a, a, an answer to that, or you have to, you will have to wait for some sort of uh, opinion from the Commission? I think, I think I think nobody found familiar with with this kind of uh, event inside Ukraine. Uh, well, the operators, <laughs> the operators definitely have. Okay, so let's move to the advertising um, sponsorship and 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 and, and uh, marketing stuff. So, um, is it uh, straightforward, uh, clear? Uh, rules for that already there, or you know, everybody will have to see how it's going to be, how, how it's going to happen in the future. Um, I think uh, Tom, you could cover that a bit about uh, the advertising and marketing uh, rules, uh, restrictions. <laughs> yes, actually, actually, for me, for, for me, it's pretty clear because I am a lawyer, not the operator, and. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I can say that uh, uh, we have pretty strong restriction, but we have some. And maybe uh, Evgenia can say more about this because uh, uh, they know how, uh, uh, they, know how they will. Yes, yes. Well, we... We, we do understand the provisions of the law itself with all the restrictions and regulations. And uh, uh, I would say that they are pretty much clear. You can, of course, uh, consider some of the restrictions in terms of uh, uh, their imp implementation of the uh, TV channels or radio stations. For example, it is uh, allowed to sponsor like different TV and radio programs. Uh, which uh, are made for the audience of 21 uh, year and above. So it's also the matter of negotiation with the um, marketing platform, advertising platform, which programs can you sponsor, which you cannot, depending on the uh, age of the audience. So mostly in, in other advertising, we're using just uh, like global advertising rules in Ukraine. Yep. So they're not special, except to the age of the audience, there are not some special restrictions in marketing of gambling. No, th there are, there, there are. Uh, so you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot advertise uh, uh, on TV and on radio starting from 11 o'clock in the evening until six o'clock in the morning. You cannot use public transport inside and outside for the advertising. You cannot use outdoor advertising within the same time slots, uh, meaning from 6 a.m. in the morning until 11 a.m. in the evening. So you can advertise during the night time. And uh, you can also sponsor some events dedicated to sports. And you cannot 
those dedicated not to sports and also to the audience uh, of 21 uh, year and below. Uh, but but the, the restrictions on the contents of the of the of the actual advertising, uh, you know, the the the, the time of ad advertising uh, is one thing, but let's say. Is it allowed to have extensive contents in the ad, let's say, in the in some sort of a website, a news feed, or, or something like that, or it's going, it's it's it, it, only the let's say logo is allowed or similar. I mean, I mean, uh, do you, do you uh, will you will you have a possibility to advertise yourself, like um, in terms of the contents? Um, um, let's say to you to use extensive uh, figures and and, 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 and and colors and stuff like that, or only a logo and that's it. What do you think? Is there a, is a clear is there a clear understanding of that in the in the legislation? Well, in terms of uh, pure in the advertising, you can use um, any all materials you would like to use, but in terms of sponsor sponsorship of events you can only use the trademark and the trade name etc of the operator um, okay understood so the last thing is um, how do you think obviously I know what you expect but what do you think uh, is the control of the unlicensed operators is going to be an issue a big issue or a relatively controllable thing. Well, how how do you see how how much of the focus on that is on the government side? Uh, and yeah, do you believe it's it, it's going to be a controllable um, jurisdiction? I think, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, Vladimir, you were first. I, I, I just want, want, want to add, I think players will control it, first of all, because uh, the payment systems will be uh, only legal uh, operators so, uh, will be allowed to use payment system and players will uh, just in, in a few years, they will come to a legal point of view. So there's, I think there is no, um, um, no sense to waste time on just controlling of uh, illegal a, a lot more, just need to, to control the payment systems. And if you control the payment system and won't allow them to work with the illegal gambling niche, it will certain, certainly help because uh, all the mass of players will come to a legal point and don't they? maybe several percentage of players will let. So uh, there is... Very good, very, very, uh, let's say, optimistic uh, thoughts from you. Yeah. I, I like it very much, but relatively optimistic. I think it will be... Uh quite hard because uh, license uh, really expensive and uh, not all local operators uh, will apply. And uh, I think, uh, and also we have, we had a big gray market before. So uh, I think it will be really hard to control it, but uh, uh, I hope that uh, operators who will pay a lot for the license also uh, will help to the government to block such uh, unlicensed operators and uh, actually government have uh, uh, all instruments to to control it in the law so uh, we will see how it works but i think uh, it will be a little bit hard to control yeah, because I think this portion is because it, it, it adds to what you already told that if, if the majority of people, relatively majority of people, doesn't want gambling at all to be regulated or to be present in, in, in Ukraine, and someone uh, promised that it's going to be controlled from the perspective that you know there's a monetary system, but if you have a big black market, you know it beats the purpose at all. So yeah, uh, if if the, if the government doesn't you know uh, take enough or give enough of focus to that yeah it, it may be a bit of a problem in the future uh Yevgeny, do you have any insights on that obviously the expectation i know the expectations that you know you would you wish that it would be purely white i wish that too 
Uh, well, uh, as, as Koliko already mentioned, the law provides for some restrictions and for some instruments how to fight with the uh, uh, operators uh, without the local license in terms of banks, BSP and uh, tele telecommunication providers. But uh, I would say that uh, the provisions of the law are not enough. Uh, you need the real instruments to fight for. And uh, again, it might be uh, clarified at the level of the secondary legislation or in some extra legislation. But I would say that the uh, government itself uh, has to provide uh, such conditions of work for the players and for the operators uh, in terms of taxation, online system of, of monitoring, etc., so that the players will not have any benefits to go and uh, use the uh, services of the international operators with international licenses. So this is like really close um, work uh, between the government and the industry to build up the rules uh, to, to keep the business within the country. Okay, um, Danis, do you have any insights uh, to share on this particular subject? Because you're from outside, so I think yeah. it's, it's a very important we had brilliant comments from from the from Vladimir Artyom and the Evgenia. Like, yeah, the players will control the market. Operators will uh, will help. And uh, the only thing we have to avoid that the situation, for example, we do have like uh, like in Sweden when it happens that without a license, it's much easier, cheaper, and uh, less nerves consuming to to run the business uh, comparing yeah, to awesome. having a license. Yeah. Yeah, I, so that's that's the thing that we all have to to avoid. Yeah, that nothing more I can add here. Well, from what I heard, because we already we we are finishing our panel. Thank you very much. It was a long, a very informative, and very nice panel for me myself. I hope for everybody else. I don't know how much uh, how, how big was the audience. I will ask us also about that, but. What I heard from you all is that it's the, the you know that your thoughts are really optimistic and that's really nice because I heard only the, 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 the biggest issue I heard is the monitoring system and no real big deal breakers uh, apart from that. So uh, it means that I believe we are going to have a very nice jurisdiction in 2021 and 2022. It's going to be very interesting to see how many internationals will, will enter. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, the, the products, how the products run, how the, what's the, you know, what do the Ukrainians like, how poker is going to, you know, flourish or not in, in Ukrainian internet. Hmm. So uh, very nice to, to be with you. I don't know if the, if the questions work uh, in this uh, platform, I don't think so, because the only things what, what, what I see here is that uh, someone was calling me <laughs> to join, <laughs> and that's it. Oh, it's also hi. So hi. we're finishing. I'm exhausted. <laughs> You're exhausted. <laughs> we had to, we that... had to reschedule a, a whole platform to have this streaming to work. So you're exhausted. <laughs> No, sorry, sorry. Questions, yeah, yeah. questions for the for the speakers. I think you can use the chat to start uh, discussing, or you can contact them directly via LinkedIn. Uh, we had a nice, uh, nice uh, viewer uh, number here. We will share that afterwards. And uh, uh, Andrews, if you would like to add maybe something. Uh, as a closing before we give the virtual microphone to Tal. Actually, I, I, want, to, I want to see Tal because I, I, I haven't seen him for years. Because oh. I, I want to see T, letter T. Uh, I want to see how does Tal look. Actually, it was really, really nice to, to be with you last year. Where I think this conference was in Milan. Milan is yes. good. Milan is really nice. Milan, one year ago. Oh, hi. So exactly I'm, one year ago, Andrews, one year ago. <laughs> one year ago. Yeah, one year ago. So, yeah, it's good to see you. You look nice. You look fresh. 
uh, uh, I'm I'm really eager to 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 hear what you're presenting. I think some 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 something about payments is that is that correct? About finance and gaming. Yeah. So thank you so much, Andrew. So no, thanks I a lot. <laughs> Passing the microphone to to Tal. Thanks a lot. Uh, to Zoltan and passing the, uh, all, all, all the thanks to his uh, uh, earphones and see you guys soon. Actually, uh, Danis will see you um, tomorrow in the panel of Scandinavia and the Baltics. And to uh, all the others, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. I see Thank those, you, uh, there's a there's a large percentage of people from, from the Baltics here. You can see the names. You can see Ineta from Connecte. You see, like, if, even you can see from, from the names who is from the Baltics, who is from Ukraine, who is who's Romanian or, or, you know, or from, from the, that area. Uh, it's nice that we see, we see Lubomira from, uh, from uh, Sofia here, everybody. So it's nice. It's, it's like I feel like at home, like, like I'm doing a physical event now. But uh, of course, it's not uh, the same. And I believe that everybody with me here is all looking yes. forward. To have it. You can also say hello to our friends on YouTube who we don't know where they are coming ah, from. Ah, okay. Wow. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, yesterday there was 280 people. And let's see today how many people will be today. And I believe, uh, you know, European, e e European gaming events, I think that we have been partnering with them since four years ago. We've been sponsoring, I think, the first event and then onwards every event. And Zoltan, you do a great job, specifically in these times when we all need events to meet face to face and it does not exist. I think that you do a great job together with your friends from SPC and Sigma. I think that at the end of the day, this is the way that we meet our clients and meet our business partners. And, uh, you know, I believe that you read uh, that this morning, even ICE that have been moved from uh, February to April, moved once again this morning from April to July. To July, wow! And let's hope it'll be then and not uh, later. And uh, Ju July 2021. So let's hope that uh, you know things will get better in this uh, in Corona uh, uh, front, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll all uh, be healthy and safe. I have a pleasure to have here uh, my colleague from Tel Aviv, Liat Naim, working uh, with me 11 mm -hmm. years now, which uh, is great, I think, <laughs> since your internship, and uh, exactly. 10 years after, exactly. Uh, Liat, please maybe tell about yourself and then uh, we'll start with, as we said, finance and gaming. Well, um, as Tal stated, my name is Liat uh, Naim Roth. Um, I've been working uh, in the law office uh, for 11 years now and uh, working, uh, you know, all matters, corporate uh, mergers and acquisitions, licensing, uh, ad tech, gaming, uh, Pretty much catering to all uh, issues required, uh, uh, plus regulation, um, GDPR issues, and um, you know providing all solutions, creative solutions, and um, everything needed for the uh, ongoing operations. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, so we should. Uh, continue on our subject time yeah. or anything I else? can also say that, you know, Liat has been working on really interesting deals of, you know, people who left Playtech opened their own companies and, uh, you know, buying assets, uh, Corsa license, lots of interesting stuff that is going on. A lot, yeah. If, if, even though, you know, Liat, there is no physical meeting, you know, sometimes you're staying at your home in Zicho, now I'm in my home in Tel Aviv, sometimes we meet in the office, there's still things going on. The thing that is really missing, we are missing, is the face-to-face -face meeting you know, offline and hopefully it will be right. This, uh, this panel that uh, Liat uh, will moderate is actually, it's like it will be a fireside chat. Liat, can you tell us more about it? Yeah, well, basically it's about um, the, what you see, the consequences and the implication of the new um, um, situation with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Um, and we'll try to focus on the main issues which uh, may affect the industry, the gaming industry, finance industry, uh, and trading. And uh, we'd like to focus on really what uh, interests our clients mostly. So uh, we we'll try to focus on, you know, narrow it down to a few questions since we are limited in time. So we should start. So Tal, can you please tell us which uh, similarities and differences 
uh, do you currently see between the online gaming and online trading slash finance? No problem. I think that, you know, there's like a dichotomy sometimes between gaming and uh, and Forex or, or financial trading. You can see, if you see, and we're returning again to conferences, maybe a part of the London affiliate conference, Amsterdam affiliate conference, the affiliate conferences where you'd normally see financial and the gaming affiliates, you, you almost see them there. It's only, always different. You see gambling conferences on one side and you see the financial events like the finance magnets, IFX, Expo, on one side. So you don't see a really conversion. The, the play where you see a good convergence is what we see here in Israel. In Israel, they know the national sport, you open either a, a online gambling operation or a financial operation. So the call centers and the logistics and the CRM and many of the, the, the platform providers have lots of similarities between online gambling and between courts. Now, if you work clean and you work decently, it's great if you can do both this and both that. Now, what happened now is since, and I believe most of the people here are from countries that don't have any restrictions on traveling, etc. You know, yesterday we were in the Picante Summit, which those who didn't see, it's a really nice marketing summit, also in, brought by the same people from uh, for the, the European Gaming. And I, I was on a panel with uh, uh, with Martina, she's from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So also there in the Balkans are some complexities. But I, I, I believe that most of the people here, you know, can travel freely. I don't think that Andrus Gabnis, you know, from from uh, Vilnius will have any issue to to travel uh, else anywhere. But uh, but you know for me as an Israeli I can I could never travel to places in the Middle East uh, and it, we always put an eye on the Middle East what's going on. Many of my clients who actually sold financial products with online forex websites focused on the Middle East. Now a few months ago there was a peace agreement between. Israel and United Emirates for, for this is it's something which is unprecedented. It's an historical moment. And then one month afterwards, uh, uh, Bahrain also signed an agreement with us. We, we cannot say uh, enough about how it, this is important for us, first of all. Now, we can see what will happen, I believe, also to the gaming industry in that sense, because Israel is like a gaming hub uh, and UAE is a financial hub. We already see and we already sign really nice agreements with clients based there in order to help them, help them also on the gaming side and also on the financial side. And all of this mix between finance and gaming, I believe will con continue and also will, will improve in the next few years. Okay, so um, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain uh, are two independent countries and in the Middle East, yeah, with different approaches. So uh, toward gaming and finance. So uh, what do you think the new status will have in any effect? Uh, what effect will the new status have in uh, the uh, European Union, Asia, or anywhere else? Yeah, so if we, you know, if we know what is the status, most of these places, you have like a, a minority of, of Muslim citizens, and then you have a large percentage of, of non-citizens who are like residents. Okay, they're non-Muslim, by the way. They're, so they're like expats living there. Now, according to the Muslim tradition, gambling is illegal. And if you do gambling, and if you offer gambling, you're expected for harsh punishment. It's important. You cannot forget about that. And, and you know, you need to understand who, who are you dealing with. And of course, with all due respect to the Islam, and we like the Islam tradition, you need to make sure that you're not bypassing the Islam, the Sharia rule. Okay? Now, if you know how to work with those UAE and uh, uh, Bahrain and those Gulf countries correctly, working and, and, and respect their banking and financial regulation, what you can use, you can use these places as a hub that you formerly used in Israel or Jordan for Arab speaking countries. Okay, uh, will there be any impact in terms of banking? I believe so because Currently, many of the financial and gaming operations, which are targeting either Asian clients and, um, let's say, Middle East Arab-speaking clients, are working with very specific banks. None of them are based out of Gulf countries. Okay, and uh, if, if we speak about uh, banks that are based out of Singapore, you know, we are working with OCBC, we work with DBS. Sometimes we work with ICICI. It's like an Indian bank. 
sounds like, and, and the website looks like McDonald's. It doesn't look really cool or very, you know, assuring when you get inside, but that's the bank. It's like very specific banks. And now, finally, and suddenly, you can work with Habib Bank, you can work with Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank, uh, ADCB, you can work with really cool top tier banks based out of places that me as an Israeli could never dream of working with. And uh, not only this, it's like really works. Like one month ago, friends of us have been in, in, in one of the first flights from Tel Aviv to, 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 to uh, Dubai. And then uh, some of the bankers that we work with from Bank of Alim also went and visited them. And, uh, you know, and, and things are actually coming forward. Uh, we have now new clients coming from these places. Uh, we have people who are trying to get licensed in the DFSA. Now, we, we already licensed several companies that wanted, wanted financial license. And in the DFA, none of them were Israelis. Now, also, we can uh, target uh, uh, Israeli clients on, on that way. And we see uh, the convergence of, of, of financial and gaming. And that is cool because you, if you see, like we see here, like uh, Andrews is working both with financial and gaming. I know also Ineta from Connecte, like uh, a household name for both financial and, and gaming. After us, we will have a panel with Marius, the CEO, the cater for financial and gaming. We see more and more financial gaming. I think the next big step will be once the UAE will also take a, another step and also license gaming there. Now, I think that when it will license there, they might say, listen, we will license gaming but not for Muslim uh, citizens. And this is very similar to what they have in hotels there. People go to the Ritz Carlton, they know. You know, if you are Christian, if you are uh, like non-local, you can drink alcohol there. It depends again on the establishment. Uh, and if you are Muslim, you cannot. And this is very similar to what happened in Singapore. Yeah, uh, you know, Jenya, our team member, has been living in Singapore, running our uh, office there. And he said that it's just amazing. You get into places, if you're Singapore resident, it's like one, a set of rules. If you're uh, non-Singapore, you can do uh, different stuff in the casino. I really believe that the next step, and I hope that I'm not hurting their feelings, but that the UAE will be as a jurisdiction to license online gaming, hopefully uh, with with assistance of the Israeli mines, like other offshore licenses, and of course without targeting local clients. That's very important, even without li targeting Muslim countries. I see. So a uh, lot of options to look forward to. Um, uh, what do you think uh, the future holds for gaming and finance in this region? I think it relates to what you just said, but if you can... Uh, yeah. I think that first of all, um, what is important here, and this also will bring us to the panel, which will, will be, come right after us, uh, is compliance. Okay. The big loophole that we know that exists in the places like the United Arab Emirates that, oh, is, is the compliance issue. And we know that they have really strong banks. They have a really, really nice and thriving fintech sector. Lots of uh, fintech startups that started from Israel, like eToro, that are now like worth hundreds of millions and, and, and are now competing against conglomerates like, like Robinhood. Uh, who, people who do not run, or, you know, it's, it's like it's a company that actually allows you to trade almost commission free, but it also has other risks. Like there was, you know, a, a suicide of some a young boy who traded on on, on Robinhood and, and and then forced, uh, you know, was was in really really big pressure. So there's, you know, both ways of seeing seeing the issues. But but the fintech sector is very very big in 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 in, in the United Arab Emirates. If you see the DFSA website, it's amazing. It's very clear. It's like very useful. And and I can tell you. Having done several uh, processes on, on different permits and licenses, it's really user friendly. What I, I, I hope and, and what, what, I, what, I, I, what, I, what, what the, the, the loophole is, is a compliance issue. And I will explain. If you do, let's say, a 5 million uh, euro wire transaction between, uh, between a bank based in the United Arab Emirates, and then you, know, you want to send it to Dr. Simon Planser, okay? Dr. Simon Planser, uh, my friend from. from Zurich, okay, and it's like five million from there to there. There will be questions. Uh, there will be questions, and in, in the because again, according to many of the of the let's say of the Western uh, regulators' eyes and the banking regulators and the central banks, United Arab, Arab Emirates, even if not officially, but it's still considered sometimes as a place which actually does not fully 
compliant with tax laws and AML laws. And this is something that will have to be addressed. It's important to understand that, that point because without being fully compliant with general tax laws, with, um, with AML uh, regulations and restrictions, with KYC issues, I do not believe that uh, um, UAE and uh, Bahrain and other uh, really nice places in the Gulf will take the next step forward and be a fully compliant nation working uh, with all the, the Western countries. Okay, so you don't think or you think? Okay, I think uh, that is, I do not know. What I hope that, no. that there will be a, a game change here and that okay. these uh, jurisdictions will take the necessary steps of compliance yeah, and okay. once they be fully compliant, I, I hope and I believe that then they can take uh, the, uh, and, and be a, like a proper uh, international player on the gambling and the financial uh, field. Okay. I think that this will also lead us, and uh, I don't know if you're all here with us, but I like, as you know, uh, last year we did it in uh, Milano and we did also in Prague. We, we like, you know, to make it dynamic, and then we, we like that the, to have a flow. So I, I don't know, Zoltan, do we already have Boaz and do we have here uh, our friend Marius from, uh, from, from ConnectPay with us here? I am checking now. Let's check. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let, me, let me give you a bit to summarize about what, what was yesterday what was, uh, uh, and what, what is going on in general. Uh, yesterday, there was a Picante Summit, a marketing summit that uh, it was not a uh, only on online gaming, it was uh, in, on marketing and affiliates, and there were lots of nice uh, panels on uh, social media with Oberner from Lemur Creative, that was really, really nice. Today, European ga uh, Gaming Congress, exactly like uh, one year ago, it was in Milano. I think that two years ago, it was in uh, Budapest or somewhere else, and uh, hopefully next year it will be live again. Um, last year, uh, it, everybody enjoyed uh, Milano, fun. enjoyed the touring Milano, being in the party uh, with everybody. Uh, this year, Prague, in the Prague Gaming Summit, was the last, the first event that we had to be in a lockdown. And, and uh, since then, we did not leave the country, uh, nor Liat, nor me. Uh, I, I had a, a scheduled live show as not a musician. Not the country so, and barely our houses. Yeah, no, well, you're not leaving your house. Liat is also a home person. She likes, you know. No, home. it's the quarantine that we, we have to be, uh, you know, to maintain and uh, remain yeah. indoors. Yeah, but this is very questionable because, uh, you know, in Israel there are rules, but there's also, you know, like exceptions to the rules. So I can tell you that yeah, most of the quarantine, we were, we, myself and Jenya and Marianne and the other team, the financial team, were all working from the office. But now there's a very uh, a rest imposed restriction. But yeah, so in Prague, there the had been a scheduled a mu music show and we already bought five tickets for musicians to come and to yeah. uh, perform with Zoltan in the hotel and then uh, you know everything was uh, you know the last minute yeah, but we had, but we, we have already we, we have already booked Prague for next year for the end of March so hopefully we can do maybe a hybrid conference if people come out of lockdown because in August we hosted a conference in Tallinn which was half 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 hybrid half people were in the in the conference room and the other ones joining online even speakers and moderators so I think next year is going to be the same thing that we will have a hybrid conference in Prague if we are allowed to do it and go to most probably Riga or Vilnius. So yeah, back to Budapest. Zoltan, I'm not sure, you know, I think that you should ask and I, I'm, I'm speaking with you always openly as a friend and a family member, you know, you know, I discuss it with people there. I'm not sure if it's the best thing to do a hybrid event. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the best event because, as you say in German, nicht hier, nicht there, or something like that. It's it's not here and not there, or something like that. I think either an event which is like uh, virtual, and and I think that the, the best actually example, and and if if, if we want to be on an objective side, is what happens with the SBC events. You know, SBC events actually bring really, really good events. You see the people from ConnectPay, they're shining. You see people also from PayNetEasy were there. You see lots of really, really nice people and lots of good content there. And in some, uh, in some panels that we saw, we saw 800 people in a virtual event in one single session, which is an amazing, okay? And I think, of course, it's not only the quantity, it's also the quality. 
The idea of a hybrid event, sometimes, you know, people will come and travel, and then they'll find themselves with 10 people. I'm not sure it's worth it. But again, you will decide, and I believe you will also consult with other stakeholders uh, coming in March, and then uh, you can decide. Yeah. So in the meantime, I see we have Marius. Yeah. Uh, here. Hi guys. Hey. Hi Marius. Marius has the famous beard in the in the in the industry. You see, I'm trying to oh, get yeah? out. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're you're getting there. You're getting there. <laughs> no, I'm getting there. You know, I'm getting there. I'm too. I, I don't know what to do. I, I have to have to remove it. It, sound, it looks bad. But uh, okay, this so is Marius. I will guys. leave you. I will leave you to Thank start you so this much. discussion. Thank you, Thank you. And Zoltan, contact do you see boss. Not do you yet, see but... him? No, but he will be probably online later. Yeah, boss is always uh, as 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 as, uh, as a Swiss clock, but uh, we're two minutes. Uh, so you know what, uh, Zoltan, I'm removing you. You can speak with the uh, with the boss, okay? Try to get him online. Hopefully, he's with me. Uh, okay, let me let me start. Also, with, uh, um, yeah. Say, so yeah, uh, say, say goodbye mm -hmm. to you. Bye, bye, bye. It, it's nice, Liat, that you, now you can see, you know, you know, uh, Vilte, you know, uh, Ineta, you know, the sales team, uh, you you already, uh, you know, you knew Salius, you know, uh, lots of the nice financial people. So this is Marius, the CEO. <laughs> nice and, to meet uh, you. Hi. Yeah, cool. So bye, Liat. Okay, have a nice bye. Time. bye. Bye. Thank you, Liat. Thank you. Guys, so I have the pleasure here uh, to uh, host um, the CEO of the best payment solutions in the Baltics for the second time in a row. For the second time in a row, and that's for a, a company that I think is even existing less than two years. So before I add the uh, Boaz, let me uh, uh, ask more uh, for Marius first to tell about himself, and then tell about his company and how did you actually do it. Hey, thanks for having me, Tal. Uh, so yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Marius, the CEO of Connect Pay. So what we do here at Connect Pay is we're a financial institution. Uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, we're operating, uh, we've been operating for about two years now, uh, give or take. Um, our main focus is and our drive is we see that uh, there's a lot of uh, online businesses that are really uh, uh, new and innovative. Um, and we see that the financial services providers, the, you know, the, the common banks and whatnot, uh, maybe are uh, not uh, getting, getting to know the, these specific online industries. They're not um, willing to spend the effort and, uh, and, uh, and time and the resources to analyze you know, how each specific online industry works and so on and so forth. So what we have identified is that this is an opportunity for us uh, and, and we see that there's a lot of businesses that are online businesses that are underserved. So what we decided to do is we, we said, hey, how about we try and uh, build something up that is meant for um, online businesses specifically. So uh, we are not, we don't call ourselves FinTech or, or, or whatnot. We are a financial services provider for online focused businesses. Uh, and our objective is to sort of uh, uh, fully package the entire um, uh, all of the financial services that are needed for an online business, roughly speaking, which is, you know, the funds acquisition from the customer of our customer, uh, the bank's account, bank accounts and settlement of those funds and reconciliation and whatnot, and obviously payments. So these are three basic, uh, basic products that we currently do uh, and with complete focus uh, in online businesses. Specifically, uh, you know, our uh, main uh, number one uh, target uh, industry that we focus on and we get to know very well is the online gaming. So this is our industry and probably this is why I'm here. I think that what, what actually in my, in my view as, you know, as working with many of your clients, you know, your, your actually slogan is banking made easy. And uh, even though you're a young company, ba banking had a, a real, a, like, a reputation of being very slow, people with suits and people who, okay, we do everything like blah, 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 blah. And then, uh, you know, with, with Connect Paid Stars, actually from the sales team, very you know, nice people who know how to actually uh, connect with, uh, with my clients. And the second thing that the onboarding is quite easy. It's like quite in intuitive. You get like an application number. Application number is quite similar to also other providers, but in the, in the way that it's very intuitive and very... Uh, online and then what i also uh, like at the end of the day that also after the sales uh, process 
all the all the all the flow is really cool. All the all the flow once you get a wire, if you do a wire, everything is, is really really cool. That that in my eyes, this is really makes makes your company uh, very special. This is what what I think. Thanks. Yes, and uh, because we focus on on these specific industries, we are able to. Um, to provide a proper, you know, easier experience. And yes, we try to be easy. Uh, our services, uh, we, we try to make our services really basic and simple and easy to use for online businesses. We're not trying to invent something very, you know, high tech or meant for, 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 for the young people. We are focusing on, on business, for, on professional business. And um, yeah, and that is what we do. You came actually from technology, right? Your, your background is actually in, in, in the, tell us more, uh, Marius, about your specific background of yourself. Okay, so yeah, I, uh, I'm a physicist by education, so I love all things that make sense. I am a strong believer that, you know, uh, everything can be rationalized, everything can be quantified and put into numbers, and everything has to make sense, everything has to be clear. So um, I come I, I, after my uh, physics education. I obviously went for technology. I'm a technologist, but then within the last probably 10 years or so, I moved more into into management uh, and management of uh, technology companies and uh, in management of um, of technology or financial uh, technology businesses. Uh, specifically, my previous career was to. Uh, bring uh, um, the digital services of Western Union into many countries of the world, which led me to a very good understanding in terms of regulation, which is the topic of today, right? Which is, I saw a lot of different approaches towards regulation. I met a lot of different regulators around the world. Uh, and, uh, and that is how I sort of built up this uh, uh, compliance uh, muscle, <laughs> so to say. Uh, and 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 I, I still believe that compliance can can uh, can be rationalized uh, and can be uh, uh, you know translated into simple rules, uh, simple externalities that you that simply define the environment that you need to work in. So that's my my career from technology to finance. Yeah, exactly, and that's that's really really cool how technology and finance actually uh, is combined. I have the pleasure. Uh, to have here another guy who's also an expert both of uh, technology and, and the finance and his career actually actually in his very fast uh, right uh, you are even you are dealing even with water that's correct with water technology it was is that correct i used to do it in the in the past but not anymore <laughs> so boss tell us more about yourself uh, you already met uh, uh, connect pay in, in events and, uh, and thank you, Marius, also for telling us about yourself and about ConnectPay. I, I would like to hear, so all of the delegates will also hear about uh, PayNetEasy and about Boaz and PayNetEasy. And then we will uh, move to our uh, first question on, on compliance and regulation as uh, Marius commented, okay? Okay, thank you, Tal. Uh, first of all, about PayNetEasy, we're a payment technology company. Uh, we've been around for over 16 years. Uh, we have two uh, main products, uh, the current product lines that we have right now. One of them is a white label payment gateway, which is used both by uh, PSPs, banks, as well as uh, gaming operators as in, in a format of a cashier. And we also developed a unique technology to keep uh, and, and preserve private data of customers from getting stolen, uh, either by hackers or by insider uh, thieves that want to steal the leads and sell them to affiliates and so on. And this uh, is a boss. This is called the, the lead protector, right? It's called LPS, lead protecting system. Yes. I can, I can tell you that there are many people who want to kill, not, not kill, but literally, you know, we don't say literally, but people who say that uh, boss company actually ruins, ruins their uh, habit because as, as I, I, I don't know if I, I don't want to do to, to put a bad name to Israelis, but in Israel, there was a national sport of taking leads from uh, companies and then transferring or selling it from, you know, an uh, employee uh, leaving a company. Not only was, in Israel. Not only in Israel. You have it in South Coast. You have it uh, worldwide. It's not only limited to Israel. I don't uh, think. Look, uh, take a look. Take a look at Marius. I believe that in the in the in the Baltics, uh, I don't think it's a good. 
I don't know. As far as from what we have learned, it, it's uh, all over. You even heard about hackers that hacked uh, Uber database, British Airways, Cathay Pacific, uh, EasyJet. Everywhere where you have a no, data... Your, your solution, Boaz, your, your, your system is not about, about hacking. Explain exactly the idea of, uh, of, of, of the leads. It's, it's the idea uh, of... Uh, the, the idea is to separate the private data of the customer from the CRM. So instead of having the phone number and email or other uh, private uh, data parameters of the customer in the CRM, <coughs> which is subjected to hacking or other ways of theft, we put it in a separate uh, private cloud of the customer and we use token in order to uh, allow communication between the salespeople and support and so on in the organization and the customer. So they can have full communication with them with voice over IP and email relay technology uh, while not having the real uh, private data of the customer. Now I see. And I, I can, what, what you what, what once showed me is how actually Let's say an employee see a, like a lead and he wants to actually steal it because let's say it's, it's like a VIP guy uh, walking and want, want to do like a $200,000 deposit. So how does it actually, what, what actually ha happens, uh, Boaz? How, how, how can you actually, uh, what, what, what does it happen? Well, f first of all, uh, if you know that you have such a valuable customer, uh, you can easily sell this lead to other companies, to your competitors or even the affiliates that will sell it further on uh, at a huge value. Today, even for a first deposit, or in, for, for example, in the Forex industry, people pay $1,000 CPA. So uh, the, the value of such private data is 1,000 euro. This is the minimum. If you know it's a big fish that is going to deposit a huge amount of money, you can sell it for many, many of uh, thousands of dollars. And this, this is very tempting for employees that get an average salary suddenly they can make a huge amount of money by just stealing the data and sell it further on, either to competitors or to affiliates that will sell it further on. Amazing. Thank you so much, Boaz. And, you know, Marius, before you joined us, spoke about data. And I know, you know, everybody's speaking about big data. Everybody's like, it's like data-driven decisions. Yesterday we also discussed it. And I know that this is something which is quite a... Actually, implementing it is something which actually is, is quite unique to, to connect pay and the compliance team. And I want to hear from Marius how data uh, uh, is actually helping uh, connect pay, enhancing all their compliance procedures and, and combating fraud and their money laundering. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, big data is a, um, a big uh, hype word, right? But what it, what it actually means is that you have uh, different types of data, different sources of data. You have huge volumes of data and you have to make rapid decisions or there's a huge velocity of, of the data, right? So when you take all of that together, this is what, what, what is big data. Now, how we, um, uh, how we uh, tap into this, so obviously, I think many of the uh, major, uh, you know, sanctions, uh, well, AML monitoring or sanctions or KYC providers, cloud providers, Many of them already, you could say, constitute uh, tapping into big data. So whereby, you know, you at the same time, you assess um, uh, tap into different databases for sanctions or interdictions. Uh, you tap into your own databases uh, of, of, of customers you work with and whatnot. So you, when you have this holistic uh, approach of utilizing your own data and tapping into all these external sources, um, that is what allows you to make uh, data-driven decisions uh, on the fly. Now, obviously, you know, big data um, in itself is, doesn't really give you anything. You have to be able to properly utilize that data. <clears throat> so some of the techniques are, you know, uh, first of all, it, it begins with, um, with rules-based approach, right? So the first thing that we do, of course, we have a holistic a uh, list of rules that we continuously well, test again. Uh, how do you actually, when, when you speak, Boaz, Boaz, we can hear you, Boaz, you can put, put on you. Uh, <laughs> you spoke, Marius, about rules. Can you, can you give, I'm, I'm sure that not all, all of the people here are familiar with Python or Perl or computer science. Can you give like an idea, a simple idea, how can you use the rule to, to check if a, if a transaction is genuine, genuine or not? 
So yeah, so rules is uh, is basic, right? So rules is uh, just simple logic. So for example, if your customer uh, you know has done X amount of payments during the last 30 days, and then suddenly he's doing a payment which is outside of uh, above the let's say average of the last 30 days, then maybe this should be uh, alerted and and uh, and you should look into that, right? That's a sample, that's an example of a rule where you have very specific conditions that you define, and then every single transaction that happens, you run by the rule. However, the you know as a, as a financial institution, and this is you know part of the problem that we have with the whole regulation and whatnot is that we uh, we have to ensure compliance. We have to ensure you know there's no money laundering and whatnot. However, we operate on a very limited data set, right? We only see what the, what we know about the customer, what we obtain the customer. We only see the payments of the customer that he does with us. So we have a limited set of data, which means we we cannot be 100% accurate based on rules alone. So this is where um, you know additional technologies kick in that we're experimenting with, which is um, AI or machine learning, for example, right? So uh, as an example, right, when when you're saying, um, oh, but you know if this payment is being done to a physical person as opposed to a business, then you should apply different rules. But the problem here comes is that, you know, about the beneficiary, we know very little. We know the bank account of the beneficiary and the name. Uh, and, you know, how do you, uh, how do you decide what rule do you put in place that defines what is a physical person versus what is a business? So it's impossible. So this is where machine learning kicks in and allows you to think, uh, build models, right? Based on history, based on data, you can build models predictive models that would be able, based on other types of information that you have, not directly linked to the beneficiary, uh, to identify if this uh, beneficiary is a physical person or a business. So, so um, if I correctly, Marius, if you see a, 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 let's say you see a company that works with you for four months, and then you see suddenly a transaction to a, let's say, to a, a, a beneficiary, which is a private individual, $50,000, sitting in in China okay this can be let's say without being racist or something this can be considered like a suspicious transaction uh, no so definitely that's not not sufficient information right it's it completely depends on on, on, on KYC and know your customers so we as a financial institution we simply need to understand what our customer does what is their business model who they work with uh, and so on and so forth and so if you know, this tran transaction to an individual for a certain amount to a certain country, you know, if it matches the profile uh, of, of the customer that we have, then it's a good transaction. If something stands out, then this can be considered as a risky transaction that we might look into. And uh, obviously we look into each transaction either by stopping them uh, if it raises more risk or by letting them through and then uh, afterwards, you know, uh, reviewing those transactions. I, and I, so I, I think that uh, it's, it's really what you actually answered g gave me really really sense on on the flow and also I think that also to the to the dev games here and I can also tell also from the side that we see you actually also uh, enhance and actually strengthen your 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 uh, compliance team not not only by uh, by using uh, um, artificial intelligence and that data driven uh, driven analytics you have actually more physical employees in the compliance team actually uh, inspect and also to make a, a fast flow of, of transactions is that correct yes that is correct well obviously you know we we are a young company two years in and we're now what almost 70 people fully staffed uh, you know we have grown seven times in revenue during the last 12 months uh, so we continue to have this tremendous growth and, 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 and uh, at a great pace so, um, and we had some issues <laughs> during the spring and summer where we, let's say, we, we were unable to control our growth properly, uh, which resulted in, in, in us being fined by the central bank. Uh, obviously, you know, that, that accelerated our need towards, uh, you know, strengthening our compliance capabilities. And this is where, you know, yes, we have uh, uh, definitely increased the, the compliance team, which is now about 25% of the entire staff. Uh, we have invested a lot, not only in the people, but also, you know, in the training um, and, and underlying technology and the tools that they use. We have multiple tools for multiple purposes. And at the same time, yes, we're continuing to innovate in 
uh, in, in uh, real-time monitoring technologies and, and, and capabilities. Thank you so much, Marriott. Thank you so much. And let's hope that the, continue, the company will continue to grow. You know that these guys, about one month ago, they took uh, the employees to a field day and actually they made like a, a map, a treasure hunt in the, in the, oh, yeah. in the streets, <laughs> which is a really cute, you know, it's a cool day, a cool way to do some uh, motivation. I was also in the offices of pa in Pain It Easy in, uh, in Moscow, and there were, I think that was, Buzz in, in, it was about 150 employees. You have a full building there near the Pushkin restaurant. Uh, I remember it was, I think, in 2016 after the uh, Russian uh, uh, Gaming Congress. Uh, I was there and uh, I was also uh, shocked to see uh, the way that uh, you guys work there, Boaz. And Boaz, yeah, uh, when, when you come to events, yeah. for, normally for two, two, uh, two reasons. One for the lead protection system, which is one of, uh, of, your, uh, uh, of, the, of the company's offerings. But uh, the second thing, which actually became even more popular nowadays, is uh, your cashier. And the, the way where you can actually uh, help clients, uh, normally uh, gaming companies, but also other events, actually swap between the, the payment providers. And that is something which is uh, uh, quite unique in, in their effectiveness and in, in helping uh, approval rate. So I would like to hear you from you. We, we heard about uh, uh, ConnectPay and, and the, the solutions. I would like to hear about uh, the, 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 the Fintegrate, the Fintegrate solution, and how does that help? Uh, uh, clients from the gaming industry specifically. So, what? Okay. Uh, basically, any op any uh, gaming operator wants to increase the acceptance rate uh, as much as possible because this drives up the revenue. Uh, but since this business is considered to be like so sort of high risk business, the acceptance rate per uh, processor or per uh, PSP might be thirty percent, forty percent very seldom you go to the over 90%. So the way to overcome it is to cascade a, a transaction that was not approved to the next processor. And uh, if the second processor doesn't uh, give you the right solution and that's not accepted, you go to the third one. So the, the trick here is how to consolidate all your payment uh, providers into one system and how to cleverly uh, set the rules of the cascading. And if you do it effectively based on territories, bands of type, type of customers with whitelist and blacklist, you can dramatically increase your acceptance rate. While at the same time, uh, we also, you need to have a very good uh, risk management system to, to block suspicious uh, transactions. That, I'll just give you an example. If you have a customer that uh, is, uh, wants to pay with a German credit card, but the IP is from Afghanistan, Mm -hmm. probably it's a stolen card and you will block it. You will not even send it to the PSP or to the bank. And the third part, of course, is you want to have a very good reconciliation and reporting system. So you can tell that the money you're getting per statement from each of your payment provider is the exact amount you should, have, you should get. Uh, doing it manually when you have thousands of transactions per week per, per processor on Excel is a very, very cumbersome and tedious uh, task. And no, people don't do it. And in many cases, they don't get exactly what they should. And we are offering uh, tools that they can, in one click, generate the exact amount of money they should get, less, of course, all the fees and the commissions based in the, on their agreement. And this is done automatically. So uh, if I understand correctly, Boaz, if I understand correctly, your system actually allows gaming operators, right? That's, that's actually the main niche of gaming and also financial forex operators. Uh, to actually cascade between those payment solution providers and then find the best that, that suits them? And it's, it's, it's basically more towards uh, credit cards acceptance or is it also towards companies like Marius, which is bo both like a bank and, and facilitating payments okay, as an email? It's, it's what, mainly, mainly for credit cards because, okay. uh, you know, in gaming, the, the sum is about $50, $100, something like that. It's not huge like uh, tens of thousands like in Forex. So many people are using credit cards. We also have full connectivity to different uh, wallets, uh, PayPal, Skrill, and, and so on. And uh, we provide the, the gaming uh, operator a payment page designed by his, uh, with his uh, brand name and colors and so on. And then the customer, when he wants to, to, to put some money in, he can decide if he wants to pay with credit card or if he wants to pay with uh, Skrill or via Bitcoin, 
and uh, all the different means of payment are already there in the, in the uh, payment page. So the customer can define what can decide and choose what's good for him. On the back end, we do all this optimization, especially between credit cards. I see. Interesting. You know, and, and it's we, we the, you know, every, everybody's speaking about compliance. Yesterday there was how to uh, stay compliant while doing the, the best practice. Always you have like the, the energy and the, let's say the, maybe there is some kind of friction between staying compliant and being good at what you do, staying compliant and, and, and promoting sales. There's always like that. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, it was not that difficult to, to be really good at gaming. Uh, 15 years ago, you could be an open uh, uh, operation, but nobody also was, uh, remembers it. Open a company, register it in uh, Costa Rica, Antigua. Playtech started that many of the first white labels uh, that I dealt with was based out of there 17 years ago. But now it's, it's much more uh, complex. And I would like, would like also to, to ask Marius and also both of you uh, on, that, uh, on that respect, on, on compliance in general. Uh, where do you think the compliance will, will take us in the next few years? Uh, will it continue to be uh, is it restricting or then end of the day will come into a status quo where everybody will make sure that they're compliant and, and, and continue uh, for, for, a, for a better industry? Let's start with Marius. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of changes happening in compliance, right? You have the fourth directive, which is, was nearly implemented, and then suddenly the fifth came up, which is an amendment, sort of, uh, as an amendment to the fourth. However, it, it really changes a lot of things. So maybe one of the topics that I would really like to touch is, uh, uh, is the risk-based approach, uh, which is dictated by, uh, by the directive. So what, what the risk-based approach really means is that you know, we're suddenly moving away from the rules. It's, there's no longer uh, you know, a clear list of rules that everybody needs to follow. Now every financial institution, a regulated financial institution, needs to come up with their own set of rules, uh, their own set of, um, of risk assessment, whereby you assess the risk of the customer and how you assess the risk of, uh, of a payment and so on and so forth. So what this leads to uh, yeah, in the market overall, right, within, within the European economic area is it leads to discrepancies, uh, discrepancies in how financial institutions treat their customers. This is why you see, you see all these problems, you know, with, for example, gaming clients, whereby they go to one pr service provider in one country and to another provider to us, for example, in Lithuania, and then they suddenly say, well, guys, you're both in the European economic area working under the same directive, but the requirements are different, right? One wants uh, one set of, of documents uh, and another wants another. So I think it, uh, it's very disruptive in terms of, of the change that these, these directives bring in. Uh, I understand the goals and the targets of the directives. They are you know, just, they are really correct. They are trying to avoid money laundering. There's a lot of you know, crime going on and so on and so forth. It needs to be stopped. However, at the same time, it is, it is disrupting this market very well, very much. And, and we as a financial institution know it is, it is a challenge for us. Uh, and also an opportunity. As a challenge, what I see, right, because it's no longer a very specific, you know, list of, of rules. You see, you know, very big banks who uh, are getting fines, you know, huge fines and hundreds of millions of euros. Uh, but did they participate? Were they the ones laundering the money? No, right? It's, they have been used. And so many other financial institutions are used by criminals, right? And then are being fined by regulators for not being able to identify, you know, money laundering scenarios and cases. Uh, but at the same time, as I mentioned before, right, the financial institutions operate on a limited set of data. So it's, it's um, like, it's, I think at where we are right now regarding regulation, there's a lot of regulations coming out. Everything is changing all the time. Everyone is adopting in different ways and at different speeds at the same time. And um, I think, all this mess will will get us somewhere. Hopefully, we'll get to a stable uh, place in some some time in, in in the next couple of years. Uh, one of the examples that I would like to to point out is you know we are in Lithuania. We're working with the central bank on an initiative called RegTech. So this is where you know we're going to try to consolidate data from. What, what is that? Can, can you repeat the name and and explain what was that? RegTech. So a regulatory technology uh, okay. project. 
so it is it is about how do you consolidate data uh, from different financial institutions under a single umbrella and then allow basically the, the the future state is that you allow somebody else to make decisions on based on that data uh, instead of you know making every single financial institution do their own analytics and do their own risk assessment and then try to identify if this is a money laundering scenario or not and try to decide if this should be reported or not instead you know give the data and allow somebody else who has access to additional data, Interpol and whatnot, and they go and catch the criminals, right, instead of the financial institutions. So it's one of the, uh, the, the initiatives that we have, we at Connect Day, we're working here in Lithuania with the central bank. Uh, a great example of it is, uh, is the Dutch banks, um, I think this year, uh, probably in September, they came together and they decided that they will build this holistic, uh, you know, uh, um, AML system and technology uh, um, that will allow um, uh, to, to catch basically these uh, money laundering uh, cases and, 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 and scenarios and catch these criminals uh, from the data that is joined amongst different institutions rather than making every bank, you know, try to catch the criminal and then find them if they don't. Uh, so I think it's very all over the place right now. A lot of changes. Everybody needs to adapt. Everybody is rushing. Uh, but, you know, hopefully the next two, three years we will get to a, a stable position and you know, we should not be um, sort of de-risking our portfolios. We should not be pushing specific industries like gaming industry into, you know, away from, from financial inclusion. And, you know, all proper businesses have to have access to proper payments infrastructure so that they could do their business. And because there are criminals, there are criminals in every industry, right? Because there are criminals that are using certain industries, be that finance or gaming, we should not be completely excluding specific industries. So I think we need to definitely work on better understanding uh, businesses and coping with all these changes in the regulation. Uh, and I think that's, that's our objective at Connect Pay. Uh, we believe that we can come to a solution which is compliant, uh, uh, provides financial inclusion and allows financial services to, pro to be provided to proper gaming clients. That's our objective. Amazing. I, I totally agree with what you said. And, and you gave uh, the last uh, few sentences, you said something very important. Many uh, banks, Marius, are so afraid for gambling. So when they see any transaction with a company, even if it does not have the name game inside, let's say Cassava Holdings, and they know that it's connected to 888, they might cancel a transaction, even though it's with a company listed on the London Stock Exchange. And this is what uh, I like with companies that actually know how to deal with gaming, right? Yes, it's how you control the risk, right? We, you need to understand the industry, understand how to control it, and put in you know, the proper controls in place so that you allow good businesses to do business and exclude the, the criminals. That's the, exactly. the point of all of it, right? Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much, Maris. Thank you so much. Boaz, uh, please wrap it up uh, and uh, let us know where you think compliance will lead us in the next few years uh, from your uh, point of view. Okay. Thank you, Maurice. Please, boss. What I can, you know, I'm not a compliance expert, but what I can uh, tell you is what we see about trends that you have in this market. Uh, as you know, for example, in the gaming industry, you have those uh, gaming operators that have uh, Maltese uh, regulation, exactly. and those that have, for example, Curacao regulation. Yeah. Uh, I assume that uh, PSPs like uh, ConnectPay will not touch the guys from Curacao because of the, are not European regulated. And since this is a large part of the market, and you may have- One second, one second. It's, it's not black and white. Always exactly. you need to remember that Curacao company can have a subsidiary from EU, and also you can have SEPA, you have SWIFT. It's, it's not black or white. Boss. So, I know, but it, it's more problematic. To, if more you have a Curacao license, it's much uh, harder for you to get a European bank to process your data. So what these people are doing, they go to, they're looking for PSP, payment service providers, that will offer them a solution that are not European banks. And this is one way to go around the regulation. So they all, they may have a few brands. Some of them are regulated in Malta, some of them are in Curacao. And that, so they will use some kind of traffic that will be processed by European uh, acquirers and others will be outside. And the other trend that we see, which is getting bigger and bigger, is that many operators say, okay, it's enough uh, hassle with these uh, uh, compliance issues. 
let's go and get crypto. Yeah. And once you get Bitcoin or uh, similar uh, cryptocurrencies, then you're off the grid of all the regulators, so yeah. to speak. Uh, this is very, see, boss, this is very great. Look, you know, we're here on a gaming event and it's good. It's a European gaming congress. And it's good that we have also non-traditional views like what you said. But if you get- I'm saying what I see in the market. These are the trends okay. that I see. By the way, even European uh, fully regulated companies, sometimes they are facing some accept uh, acceptance issues with their European acquirers. So the, in parallel, they, they also offer a way for the customers to pay with Bitcoin. Course. Yeah. And uh, I'm not saying that these are criminals, but uh, it, it's another way of payment, which we see it's, it's, it's a trend that we see with uh, customers in, in this uh, field of uh, gaming. Absolutely, Boaz. You, you see it in gaming. You see it also in Forex. The idea, exactly. people who are not familiar with this, is something that in the last one and a half years, we saw a trend. You know, it's like you have the you have the website that throws you out to, to a, a, a website where you buy crypto and then it gets back. And then specifically, you, you cannot have a charge back because you buy crypto, but the, the commissions are quite high. And again, okay. it's it's very great. This this idea is very great. I cannot say that it does not work, but it's like you know, I it has a it, it's a gray area as far as of, of the regulators. But it's a natural part of this business nowadays. I don't, I don't know many uh, gaming operators that don't have one, at least one uh, way of getting crypto. There are several ways of getting it, but at least one. And, and this is a trend that is happening. There is no way to go around it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, boss. Apart of that crypto, do you have any other uh, uh, maybe anticipation regarding the compliance for the next year? Do you think that the compliance will continue and be, you know, as you see, Mario saw compliance as something that actually is disrupting and actually forcing people to be innovating. You know, sometimes a PSP can get a small fine and then it actually makes its, its compliance much larger. You see, like, and this is something that happens all the time. You saw 888 got an 8 million fine, a pound fine, and, and, and got different and, and a different approach. And, uh, you know, of course, I'm not, uh, uh, of course, uh, suggesting that fines is a good thing, but I'm, I'm asking you, Boaz, how do you see a uh, compliance? having an impact on our, our, our industry. And, and I think you will have two things, two, two trends. One of them, as uh, Marius mentioned, the compliance regulations are getting more and more strict. So the gaming operators will have to, to comply to it and provide all the information and everything if they want to work with financial institutions like ConnectPay or similar. At the same time, when you have too much regulation, people will, will, wait, will look for ways to go around it. And what I mentioned about crypto and uh, banks outside of the EU, uh, this is this is part of what's happening. And there's no way, I don't think there's a way to avoid it. You try to block something, people will find a way around it. Uh, so in one hand, you will have like the perfectly strict companies that will comply with everything. And uh, all the European banks will be very happy to serve them with very low rates. And in parallel, you will have the, the other ones. And they, there's some coexistence between these two parts of the industry. And they, everybody knows it. I don't think it's a, it's a secret what I'm telling, telling right now. No, it is. Boaz, thank you so much. Marius, thank you again. Guys, it was a pleasure. I think we had a great panel. And for me, it was also informative because I also learned new things from both of you. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Tal. I'm Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zoltan. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Zoltan, you, you see what I see already, Eva. I remember seeing Eva. You remember we met in uh, München. It was again one one yes, year ago. Yes, of course I remember. Oh, yes, year ago. You remember that when <laughs> when Corona when Corona was the name of a beer. Corona yeah. was the name of the, <laughs> the nineties. Who did the rhythm of the night? And uh, we didn't know what is Corona there. So Eva is from WH Partners, and my friend also Dr. Robert Scalina, also. Uh, also from WH Partners is here. The same team, uh, yes. Jan is also here? Jan? Jan from Czech Republic? Yeah, Jan he's connecting now. <laughs> he's connecting. And where is my friend Jakub? Jakub uh, from Endorfina. You know, funny that Endorfina, everybody knew uh, one, and a half, one and a half years ago, they had a really nice booth in, uh, in ICE. And then uh, a very exotic booth with lots of uh, young models <laughs> and you know beautiful uh, women. And then it did such a scandal that after what Endorfina did in their, uh, in their booth, I think it was a good way, it's kind of in a good way. It, 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 it brought lots of work for Jacob. 
and uh, lots of business for Jacob, hopefully. But then afterwards, uh, Ice and Clarion just announced from now on, you know, no more booths like uh, Endorfina, no, no more naked women selling his stuff in, uh, in, in Ice. And I think, I think it's a good thing that happened, also on the scandal way and also in a good thing. So we have, uh, do we have Jacob here? Yes, he is here. He's, he's just good. getting prepared. But Tal, do you remember our first conference in Budapest? I remember. I also miss it. I miss it. No, it you... Was, uh, yeah. You missed was... that one. <laughs> Sorry? No, because you know today that we had these technical issues with the conference. I remember that in Budapest... Yeah, there was had... a bomb there. We there had a bomb scare. So we, we got throughout that conference that now the, all these digital technical issues are just a, a, a piece of cake. <laughs> At least it's only an issue. Yeah, I remember it was, I think, yeah, exactly four years ago, there was a bomb Five. in the, also, it was a bomb in the kitchen in, 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 in Budapest. I, I think the second one in Budapest was in the, in the Kempinski, but the first one was in a, uh, I think it was a, it was a cheapish hotel. It, it, was, it wasn't as good as the Kempinski, but I, I, that was the first event that you did. And I really enjoy you sponsoring you since then. I remember that everybody, two hours in the middle of the event, just stopped and went outside. It was good for networking. Yeah, and today there's, there was this crash and everybody moved to Zoom. So hopefully everything is for a, for a good thing. So thank you, Zoltan, thank and you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Boaz. Thank you, Marius. Thank Yaku. you. Have a great day, guys. How are you here? Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Jakub? Okay, I can see you now. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I can see you. Hi, Jan. <laughs> Hi. How are you doing? Good. We are good. I see that Jakub, both Jakubs are connected, but for some reason we cannot hear here, Jakub from Endorfina, the moderator of the panel. Let's just wait. So how has been everybody during this period? Jan, Eva. <laughs> I'm fine, how doing, are you? Doing well your conference. Let's just see what's happening with Jakub. I think that he's muted. Now we should be able to hear him. Jakub. Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. So it, it's, it appears that my headset is not working as a microphone. So I'm ah, okay. sorry for, for the mess from the beginning, but what would be a digital event if everything worked well, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will leave you to start your panel, and once Anna arrives, she will just appear, okay? Oh, Anna I'm also here. online. Ah, she's here, but I haven't seen you. Okay. Sorry about that. Jakub, you can go ahead and start. <laughs> Only, only thing we are still missing, Robert, but hopefully he will find its way into this meeting because he mentioned... Uh, earlier during our pre-call that his Zoom connection doesn't work well, but hopefully he will be uh, able to figure it out and will join us later. So anyway, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or on your uh, broadcast and live stream and also uh, good whatever part of the day to you who is watching us from, uh, from the later on. So uh, today we will be discussing with my fellow panelists, we will be discussing the gaming and gambling report of the Central Europe. So uh, we have very interesting panel. So let me introduce our panelists. We have uh, Mr. Jan, oh, I'm sorry, not Mr. Doctor already because Jan Rehola already uh, just recently passed his PhD of course, on gambling. And besides of that, uh, Jan Rehola has uh, 10 years experience on gambling field. He worked uh, 
on the Minister of Finance, then he switched into the commercial sector, joined uh, a PS legal law firm and co is co-founder of the consultancy company Bet on Skill Consulting. And also Jan is founding member and director of the Institute for Gambling Regulation, which we will hopefully discuss later on. Uh, from Poland, we have Jakub uh, Miskorowski. Jakub has also more than 10 years experience in the professional sports market and betting business. He is also certified UFA football coach and still active football performance anal uh, performance analysis. And he right now he works as the chief commercial officer at StatScore. Moving on to the ladies part of, the of our channel, we have uh, Eva Lehman Witt from WH Partners. Eva is head of Polish desk and part of strategic partnership under WH Partners with Isabella Jiglitska and Partners a very well reputed full service law firm in Poland and as well of a member of LA Law. Also from Poland, we have uh, Aneska Vietranska Chilowska. Hopefully I pronounced that uh, correctly. I forget to ask you before. It doesn't uh, matter. Uh, My surname is just, <laughs> just a <laughs> nightmare for anyone who is not Polish. <laughs> Anyway, Anna is a local partner at Attorney at Law. She is head of the games and gambling practice and therefore more than capable, uh, capable to provide advisory for the whole gambling sector. Oh, and finally, we have uh, Dr. Robert Scalina joining in in the last moment. Uh, Robert is the partner of WH Partners and uh, Czech advocate as well as registered European lawyer in Malta. He is based in Prague and works uh, and is joining Malta regularly. Uh, and finally, I am your moderator. My name is Jakub Kolomichenko. I'm, I'm working as a head of legal for Endorfina company. And I think it's about time to start digging into our very interesting topic. So I would like to start with uh, each of the panelists, so if they can just provide us with a very brief update or introduction into, uh, into the gambling market, which is in the field of their expertise. So Jan. Why don't you start with the Czech Republic and provide us with some basic overview and background and some future updates maybe. Okay, thank you Jakub for a nice introduction and uh, I will try to keep it brief as an introduction about the Czech Republic. I believe that majority of you knows how the gambling market in Czech Republic is structured. We have probably the new gambling act which is in force from beginning of 2017. Uh, the market itself, it's when it comes to the figures, it, it, it's very healthy and the regulation on paper looks very good because all the products uh, could be operated on a, on a Czech gambling market uh, based on online. There is also any, there is no any monopoly, so even you can get a license for around the lotteries uh, in the land base and online sector as well. And therefore, on uh, legislation, it seems that there are not many obstacles for foreign operators to enter the market and, and, and be active in the Czech Republic. But in reality, it's uh, as uh, usually the devil is in a detail. And the biggest detail in the, in the Czech regulation is that uh, currently, if you want to open up the uh, account with a gambling operator, you need to uh, register yourself in a shop of the operator so it's not very solution for 21st century uh, if you want to play online that you still need to go to the, to the brick and mortar facilities of the operator you have uh, one of the chances that you can also use so-called checkpoints or use local banks which can help you like remotely identify the players but this process is very complicated for foreign operators to employ in order to register the players and and that's the main reason why the, the big flux of foreign operators that, that uh, apply for license uh, in the Czech Republic in 2017, uh, that only the Poco Stars finish their, their license application. And, and uh, there is some more lottery foreign operators who are also operating, but it, it's not very substantial. So currently the Czech market is still dominated by local players. And unless the AML regulation uh, would be changed, I think it will stay it is, as, it, as it is right now. Okay, thank you for this introduction to the market. Robert, what is happening in Slovakia right now? Hello, everyone. Uh, 
Well, what is happening in Slovakia, uh, the, the market uh, essentially uh, opened for the online business and foreign uh, operators uh, last year. Uh, it opened, uh, it's, a, it's a similar story to Czech Republic, but for different reasons, uh, opened on paper, but in reality it remained uh, divided between the local operators who were active already before. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, until, until last year, the market was uh, very much uh, a gray uh, market. Uh, after, uh, after last year changes, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, the market that is uh, more or less compliant with, uh, with the EU, EU laws, but uh, uh, it's uh, very difficult for foreign operators are very difficult. It's uh, for, for the size of it, it's a very difficult business proposition for them to enter the market because the license uh, uh, fee application is uh, quite high for the size of the market. It's uh, basically 3 million euros uh, uh, per online license, or if, if they apply for betting and gambling, it would be 5 million. Uh, but still, uh, in, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the license fee plus a few additional things, uh, practical things that uh, uh, make foreign operators' uh, operations uh, um, relatively difficult, uh, again, compared to the size of the market, because you always need to kind of take it uh, with the view of, you know, if they are looking at, uh, at some of the Scandinavian markets or uh, if they are looking at the uh, US or if they are looking at elsewhere, and they need to devo devote resources somewhere because it's obviously not unlimited amount of people that are working in these uh, gambling companies. Uh, you know, they they choose different markets. So that's uh, that's the story that uh, the the market the market opened, uh, and only the local operators are operating. But for the benefit of the players, the good thing is uh, that uh, online gambling, uh, uh, meaning not only betting, uh, uh, opened as well. Uh, this year and uh, the, it was a coincidence that the timing was very good because it's, uh, it basically uh, started uh, uh, you know beginning of this year uh, when the uh, when the whole pandemics came and uh, when uh, uh, the sports uh, betting was quite limited everywhere around the world due to the no sports happening uh, so this was uh, this was a boon I think for both for the for the players and for the operators that uh, there was the ability uh, at least uh, you know to have uh, this product uh, on the market and uh, I, I can mention uh, later you know there are a few things uh, happening on the on the land-based uh, side but uh, you know that's sufficient for introduction I think. yeah we will get to this later Anna what about Poland can you give us the brief introduction basically what is happening and or not happening in your jurisdiction regarding the gambling industry? Sure, with pleasure. So under Polish law, the organization of online gambling, except for betting and uh, promotional lotteries is covered by the state monopoly. This monopoly is exercised by the state treasury company Totalizator Sportowy in the form of an online casino, Total Casino and online lotteries, Lottopel. Uh, as far as online betting is concerned, uh, currently we have 18 uh, licenses for online betting. And in total, there are 19 license operators in Poland. So one is, 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 has not a license for online. Uh, however, one of these operators, Millennium, has suspended its operation due to COVID. This was the operator with a very extensive uh, network of uh, land-based uh, betting shops and its operation has been suspended in the beginning of uh, COVID crisis. Rumor has it that there are another three up to four operators uh, who are uh, under the licensing process, and one of them is said to be from the Nordic countries. When it comes to the, to the size of the Polish market, it is estimated for 1.5 billion euros, so it's, it's pretty huge. And uh, according to the same estimation, uh, about 50 up to 60% of the market is still unlicensed, so it's still in the gray zone. 
The number of licenses for online betting uh, is, uh, is not limited by law. Uh, it's, it's unlike, for example, it for, as it is for land-based casinos or and gambling arcades, where the maximum of location is uh, set by the law. So I think that will be the, the the most important things about the market. Of course, we've got in online in betting, we've got the the the, the biggest nightmare of uh, of the of the Polish operators, which is the twelve percent turnover tax, uh, which which makes uh, the and the operation uh, of uh, of uh, foreign companies not so lucrative and which uh, discourage them from entering the Polish market. And uh, there is a number of restrictions which uh, one applying for a Polish license must meet. Uh, they are with respect to the minimum share capital, no criminal records, uh, no tax and social contribution areas, IPC installation, and uh, there are also restrictions on admissible payments and advertising methods. Okay, so I think that that would be. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, speaking of the sports betting, it must have been quite a challenging year in, in this uh, current situation caused by the COVID-19 disease, disease, of course. So, Jakub, why don't you tell, tell us more details about what is really happening in the betting world for, in this uh, crazy year so far? Well, yeah, the, the year made a lot of damage um, to the market and uh, those that were prepared better for this uh, survived with less damage. Those that did not prepare themselves so well uh, struggle until now and they can struggle also until the end of the year. So basically by preparing themselves better, we understand um, diversification of um, the sources of income. So basically, uh, if the betting companies were too much dependent on the traditional sports, which were always all used to, like soccer, basketball, etc., um, they found themselves with a problem when all of the sports were cancelled because never in the history before we had a situation when all of the sports were cancelled. So even during the Second World War, when we didn't play sports here in the Europe, um, still uh, in the North America, the sports were being played uh, normally. Now almost the whole sport, sport, world of sports stopped, like um, with a couple of exceptions, like Belarus, um, Nicaragua, but it was not too much to offer. So basically those that were not so into esports uh, really had problems during that tough times because they had really almost nothing to offer. So um, this was the biggest problems. And to be very honest, uh, for the betting companies, it is not so easy to, uh, almost, almost it is impossible to convert their traditional users into esports. So basically they need to be very open to different uh, target groups because um, the people that are more into esports, these are the so-called young adults. So the people um, to whom they have to reach with different kinds of um, um, promotional with different kinds of uh, communication. So basically, uh, some of the companies which were more uh, open to esports did they definitely did well during that time. Uh, for some, it was a time to start uh, rapidly adding esports to their offer. And of course, it is easier to add, for example, the competitions in FIFA 20 because uh, it is somehow comparable to the traditional sports than to uh, merge people to play, let's say, dot, uh, two low CSGO because this is something completely different, something completely understandable for people that are not uh, into esports. So it was a tough time and definitely now when we see a situation when some of the competitions maybe not stop, but we see, for example, here in Poland, every match day, one or two games being cancelled due to COVID-19, I think that more of them think about what can happen next this fall and how to prepare themselves better. So basically, they definitely will be more open to esports. And definitely, uh, it was much easier for uh, those that were more reliable on uh, online betting. For those that are more into the land-based betting, it was a problem because for some time, this, uh, the shops were closed. And some of the companies invested heavily in, for example, self-service betting terminals access to which were also um, being unable. So definitely it was not an easy time. And I think that now most of, more of the companies uh, think about different scenarios to try to prepare themselves better. But of course, knowing how tough it is to prepare in such a short term and knowing uh, how unexpected the future can be, definitely not an easy time for the betting operators here in Poland. Yeah, that uh, that's very interesting. It's apparently the new normal, how they call it. And uh, speaking of the esports, it's not only about how it's being accepted by the uh, by the players, 
it's also uh, how it's going to be uh, uh, accepted by the regulator. So Eva, can you tell us more about the regulation of the gaming in uh, Poland? Um, hi, good afternoon to everyone one more time. Yes, um, I would like to add some comments to what Anna uh, already said that uh, the Polish uh, gambling law was uh, has not been significantly modified. So uh, the situation in Poland is quite stable. Also regarding the esports, like uh, you mentioned, um, Polish gambling law um, regulates uh, few types of uh, gambling games. But what is important, games where there is no element of chance. Um, are not subject to the Gambling Act. And uh, generally speaking, the gaming uh, sector is, um, the gaming industry has grown rapidly in Poland. And I just uh, checked the, some figures for you. And the, annually, the gaming industry in Poland generates revenue growth of about 30%. And in 2019, it amounted to actually uh, around uh, 600 million dollars, uh, so which over which is over 2.1 billion Polish zloty. So the the market is is huge. The market is huge. It's quite um, due to the lockdown and the COVID situation. You know, many Poles were locked uh, at home, so they uh, the the esport is is uh, more and more popular in Poland. The, um, actually, the the main events, uh, which is uh, every year based in Katowice, Katowice regarding esports, um, was cancelled due to the COVID. Uh, it was in March this year. But um, this is a huge event and every year um, it's uh, more and more companies are interested in taking part uh, in this event. So, and I know that the main, uh, may, maybe not the main, the, the biggest operator of, uh, regarding betting, uh, STS in Poland is quite uh, much involved in, in esports. So um, generally speaking, it, there is a future for esports uh, uh, in Poland uh, and it's uh, this part of industry is uh, rapidly growing and developing so I guess it's um, it's a maybe a, a future for the for the companies which are uh, now uh, which 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 have troubles now uh, financial troubles regarding the covid situation Interesting. Maybe interesting. I would I would maybe I would add to it also that that the value of this of the esport market in Poland is estimated currently for 10 million euros already. And uh, as as Eva exactly said, there is a boom for gaming company games developers. We've got over 440 uh, games developers in Poland. 45 of them are on are listed companies. 12 are on the main market Warsaw Stock Exchange. 33 are on alternative uh, market in Poland, so New Connect, and 21 are um, preparing for their debut on this New Connect market. So it's yeah. a really, really important part of our economy. And I, I would say that it's, it's, it's just a foolish hit because with a couple of a very great companies like CD Projekt, like Petland, now we've got a number, a hundred of uh, very interesting games developers with uh, a bright future ahead of them. And since in all the, uh, the games, there are, there are many elements uh, which are related to gambling, just to mention loot boxes or yes. uh, virtual tokens, virtual yes. currencies. Yes, there, there will be a lot of things that we will have in common as a gambling lawyers with yeah. the gaming uh, industry. And, and we will get like to, to this to this later later on. Uh, <laughs> I, I will just add one 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 comment if I can. Okay, um, sure. Just it's, it's expected. I read that the, this market in two thousand twenty three. I guess uh, the value of the market may reach even uh, two hundred billion dollars uh, in Poland. So uh, it's just uh, one more comment to what Anna just said that this is really a that that could be a, a, a big part of uh, of the market uh, soon. That's certainly a huge market and too big, uh, too big, too big market to ignore in the future. But uh, we will get to this later because uh, I would like to return back to the Czech Republic. 
uh, when Jan mentioned that uh, there is specificity of the Czech gambling law, and uh, it's actually the fact that the players who register online must, due to uh, AML regulation, must further go to uh, to either the uh, operator's branch or to the Czech governmental office in order to physically verify its ID. Uh, it's actually painful and is being criticized for a lot of, basically since uh, the new gambling law uh, became effective. So yeah, is there any, uh, in the future, is there any bright uh, future uh, for this, uh, quite uh, not very practical future and specific, uh, specific of the Czech gambling law? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for this question. It's actually a very actual question because currently it's being debated in the parliament. Ministry of Finance uh, is, no, is well aware that this is the biggest obstacle for foreign operators to enter the Czech market. And therefore they introduced amendments to the AML law which uh, allow also gambling operators to register players remotely. Basically, they can do it by scan two IDs and, and provide one payment uh, from the bank account of the player. And the player, in this case, don't have to go, or doesn't have to go to the, to the brick and mortar facilities of, of the operator. So this proposal was pushed by the Ministry of Finance and actually was debated last Thursday on plenary session of the Czech Parliament. But unfortunately, uh, there was also amendment which uh, keep the state as it is right now. And in the third reading uh, last Thursday, this amendment was adopted, meaning that from the last Thursday, there is a high probability that this stay stage uh, of the of the AML law will stay as it is right now. Uh, we have still like Senate in a, in front of us, so there is some chance that in the Senate this uh, topic would be again open and maybe this biggest obstacle would be lifted but uh, according to my reading the situation i believe that, that uh, from i would say like 95 percentage probability uh, they won't be changed to the current state of play and uh, the market therefore will be still like dominated by domestic players and is that the only catch of the Czech gambling regulation, basically the only showstopper for the foreign operators, or are there any other specifics which actually prevents the foreign or take making the Czech gambling market less attractive? Because speaking of the volume of the players, it seems to it seem it looks to me that uh, people like gambling in Czech Republic. So I wonder why, why this jurisdiction is not more popular. I think you raised the question that you know the answer because uh, as uh, representing the, the game supplier, you are aware of the, this devil detail, uh, which make the, the market not that attractive. But uh, I would say those ones are not that big. They are like that there are requirements for max win, meaning that uh, the, from one thing you cannot win more, more than half million check rounds, which could be some limit because the game producer will need to adapt their games. But still on the Czech market currently, uh, there are the games for, from I would say, Playtech, Micro Gaming, Net10, all the like uh, international providers. So basically they can adapt the games or they can introduce only some games which fit to the technical regulation of the Czech Republic. So those things, I, I think it could be some showstoppers but definitely the AML I see as the biggest obstacle on the side of the operator. There are a few of them on the side of the game suppliers, but still they are not that huge in order to prevent the under the market. Because as you mentioned, if you compare the figures like spend per capita uh, in, in the Czech Republic and the jurisdiction, uh, you will see that the Czech market comparing uh, the size of the Czech Republic itself with other neighboring countries, you will see that the, the we will like to gamble here in Czech Republic. <laughs> I would like to follow follow up with the same question to Robert uh, regarding Slovakia, but uh, I'm afraid that Robert has uh, has uh, some problems with the connections. So, or if you can uh, hear me, Robert, can you can you try to describe some other showstoppers? Basically, the same question because you have mentioned that there is rather high uh, administrative fee for Slovakia. 
Is there anything else which prevents uh, the foreign operators or makes the uh, Slovakia regulation less attractive for the foreign operators? Hi, I'm not sure if you can see me now and hear me now. We cannot see you, but we can hear you, so better than ah. nothing. It's interesting because I, I, I switched on the camera back, so apologies for that. Well, anyway, uh, the, the, now we can see. The most uh, the, the most uh, relevant dimension, you know, is the is the high fee. Uh, the other uh, issues, you know, for the operators, I mean, they are practical, but you know, they are uh, not you know not of such a magnitude, uh, I would say, as the face-to-face -face, uh, identification in Czech Republic, for example, if I can compare. Uh, uh, at least the operators, you know, do, do not see it, uh, uh, you know, that way. Uh, there is a requirement to have a to have a server uh, in Slovakia, uh, so it's it's not sufficient to have a mirror server. Uh, you, you need to have your server uh, in Slovakia. Uh, you know, that, for example, is not a limitation in, uh, in, in Czech Republic, where you have, where you can have it elsewhere in the EU. Uh, uh, you know, furthermore, you need to have uh, uh, like a representative uh, on the ground uh, in Slovakia who will communicate with uh, uh, with uh, with the regulator, and uh, uh, you know that is that is a requirement of of a physical per, uh, you know presence of a, of a person. Uh, but uh, other than that, you know, uh, the the requirements are. Uh, Pretty, pretty much, you know, uh, things that you see around uh, Europe. So there isn't any one particular uh, issue that would be, you know, a big, uh, uh, big show, showstopper for for the operators. It's, it, you know, it really comes more probably to the to, to the willingness of the of the operators, uh, given the size of the market. Uh, you know, the Slovakia is uh, five million population. You know, so it's uh, half the size of Czech Republic. Uh, it's uh, it's not a, that it's a that it's a uh, bad uh, bad market, but it's uh, you know really uh, if you compare it to some uh, some other markets, it's uh, it's much smaller. Uh, what what is the you know for for other than the foreign operators, you know if, uh, if the operators have any limitations that you know preclude them you know pretty much from from operating. I don't think it applies, you know, to online operators. Uh, where it, uh, you know, more and more applies is really to the land-based operators of uh, primary slots, slot machines, uh, because uh, um, uh, there there has been a, uh, a possibility for the for the municipalities to prohibit uh, uh, all types of uh, gambling except for sports betting, pretty much, and and lotteries. Uh, on the ground of uh, of uh, of their territory, okay, of the, on the ground of the municipality territory, and some of the some of the municipalities uh, 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 use that uh, possibility, but it was only possible uh, if at least uh, thirty percent of the adult uh, uh, population or you know so, uh, inhabitants of the of the municipality signed a petition uh, where they said uh, it affects uh, public order. Uh, and the municipality uh, as authority uh, would need to deal with it and could have approved uh, uh, a, uh, a general binding order prohibiting. Uh, and and that was that was something that you know you need the, you needed the petition. But uh, two weeks ago there was a, there was a change of law of the gambling law uh, that passed through the Slovak Parliament. By the majority, by the new majority, there were elections uh, in March. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, change basically allows for the municipalities to ban uh, uh, presence of uh, of primarily online casinos and gambling uh, uh, gambling rooms where the where the slots are operated on their territory without the need of any. Uh, petitioned by the uh, by the inhabitants, so uh, it you know it will be much easier for any municipalities, depending on you know who has the majority there, to prohibit pretty much gambling on their on their territory. And and, and in addition to that, there was also a change uh, which uh, which stated that uh, previously uh, a gambling room couldn't be further 
away from the from or could be located only as long as it was at least 200 meters walking distance from schools or from social facilities. Now it was changed to 500 meters, but basically by horizontal line, meaning you know it's not a walking distance, so there is no way around it. So pretty much in a, in the densely populated uh, cities like uh, the capital or a few other cities or or basically any any municipality, you know. Uh, it uh, if if the if the municipality adopts uh, 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 you know uh, a, a order that this applies, uh, then uh, there, there, there there will be no possibility, pretty much in practice, for any gambling rooms and any slots to be operated in, in Slovakia. So there is no there will be no prohibition per se, but by the wording of the law, that will be the outcome. Oh, well, that sounds actually interesting. Maybe we can. Yeah, start building some local Las Vegas uh, somewhere around Slovakia in mountains, in Tatra mountains, for example, you can you can join the outdoor and the indoor, it would be very interesting. <laughs> okay, moving on back to the Poland and back to the very interesting discussions regarding the e-gaming. Uh, Jakub, do you actually believe that this will be the future of the sports betting, especially when we consider the situation of the last year or this year, when basically there was almost nothing to bet? Well, I think this is the only reasonable move for the betting industry, basically for two reasons. First of all, situation like this year, I know that this is something that we did not encounter in the past, but we cannot say that COVID will not last long or that the next viruses will not hit us hard. So basically we need to be prepared for a situation where the traditional sport is almost unavailable, which is one thing, but there is other, I would say even more interesting factor, which is like the new generation for which uh, betting on a traditional sport is maybe not so attractive, but betting on sports, they know and understand better because they play them themselves online. They play them with their colleagues and they follow the big tournaments. It is something completely new. And again, there are some big companies uh, that already understood it. For example, if you have a chance to see STS new uh, commercial, it is fully uh, addressed at the young people uh, who are into esports, who are into different kind of uh, mm, feelings coming from the sports and different kinds of participation. So basically, I think that this is a move that has to be done anyway. But basically, it is again not by trying to convert your uh, actual uh, current um, users into esports, because it is impossible for, let's say, people in their uh, late 50s, it would be very hard to tell them, okay, so now let's play Dota, because they will not understand, not accept it, not like it, and they will definitely not want to follow. For them, you have to have something in the offer from the traditional sports. But for the youth, this is definitely um, the good choice, and because now esports are, uh, as we already know, generating really huge uh, business for everyone involved, and it would be uh, a huge uh, loss for the betting industry not to get more into it. But again, it is all about building the right relation with the target audience. And definitely it is not something that can be done in a month or two. It is something that will take probably years. But uh, I think that those that will uh, be leaders of this process, uh, these are those that already have started to uh, open and explore more into esports, not to have it like at the end of their offer, but to have it more visible in their offer and definitely treated better in their offer. Okay, uh, moving on from the sports betting into the let's say, regular gambling. Uh, very uh, up-to-date problem is with uh, loot boxes. So Eva, could you please uh, briefly explain to the audience, which is by uh, what I can see on the YouTube, is actually increasing very well. And so could you, could you please ex briefly uh, explain to them what is the loot box and what is the problematic which the gambling or gaming industry is facing with them and what is the position of the pol or poly government regarding loot boxes? Eva, can you hear us? So uh, please unmute your microphone, unfortunately. Okay, now you can hear me? Uh, very well now, perfect. Okay, uh, briefly explain what does it mean loop boxes. Um, um, as most most readers and most most people know, a loot, loot box is broadly uh, recognized as a box or create or a case or a pack. Uh, I mean, this is the content of which is generated randomly, uh, purchased by the player in the uh, hope that uh, upon opening it, they will find a digi digital asset such as a weapon, power, character, 
or skin uh, which can be used to gain the, an advantage uh, or simply for um, aesthetic reasons in a game. So um, this is how we can uh, define what the loot, bo loot, box, uh, loot boxes uh, are. Um, and loot boxes can be both so in independent. The Sorry, yes. I'll put it into the context. Is that actually the big market? Because when I first heard about mm -hmm. it, I was wondering why would anyone even spend money for something which you cannot even touch? So is that, is that huge? I think that the, the, the key issue with loot boxes is that uh, loot boxes can be classified as a type of microtransactions. So, um, so um, there is a lot of uh, controversy uh, around the loot boxes uh, because players uh, usually do, do not know what, what's inside. Uh, and then they, I mean, people are spending a lot of money for, for loot boxes. Like I yeah. said, um, this is a type of uh, microtransaction. And um, because of that, uh, it's also a, pl a problem for amongst the miners uh, who play games in connection with, uh, with uh, which loot boxes are often offered. So uh, there's a huge discussion in, I know that in the UK, um, in other European countries, and uh, also in the United States regarding the loot boxes, whether are, they can be uh, recognized as, uh, as a gambling already, or uh, it's actually not covered by the, for instance, in Poland by gambling act. Okay, moving on to the regular gambling in, or regular online gambling in Poland. Anna, how, how does the war? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, how does the war against the unregulated operators uh, looks like? Uh, I have heard that the Polish uh, uh, Minister of Finance declared that the grey market is shrinking. Is that really so? Yeah, yeah. They declare even that to eight point five percent, but wow. it's not the the same calculation or how it's perceived by the license holders who still believe and uh, i guess that they've got a better data uh, based on on the um, on, on on the on the statistic internet statistic that it's still 50 60% why does all is are all those uh, steps undertaken by the polish government ineffective well uh, the main um, the main tool that it used for combating the unlicensed gambling in Poland is the blacklist. The register of domain names uh, used uh, in Poland without holding a Polish license. And uh, the biggest problem with it is that it it only includes the names of the domain. So it it could be that let's say then the name gambling.com. And this will be put on the register. So the next day you've got gambling1.com. The next it's, it's blocked. So you've got gambling2 and, and so on and so on. Once a, a domain name is entered into the register, uh, the um, internet uh, connection telecommunication companies must stop to, uh, allowing the, the user to, to access this domain. And the payment providers need to block it. And in theory, it works. But in practice, since the, the name of the of the domain is is next change updated with adding additional number, it doesn't yeah. work. Another reason for that is that uh, in Poland, effectively, and it was um, confirmed by the, um, by the by the by the latest reports, uh, in effectively in Poland, the only um, person entities that uh, that are investigated and that are punished are the players and sometimes affiliates. Uh, Polish government admitted in one of the reports that it has no legal tools to effectively uh, chase after the offshore operators who are not physically present here in Poland. So that's the reason why, why the current, uh, uh, current uh, solution with the blacklist does not work. Another reason is that there are still some controversies and uh, they will be, I guess, for a couple of next years, whether the Polish gambling regulation is fully compliant with EU law. And uh, this um, um, allegation that it, it could be not co fully compliant rely on the uh, principality of proportional measures that are undertaken. And it's always related to the fact that um, 
based on the on the hard data about the uh, level of gambling addiction in Poland, uh, there there seems that there was no real reason just to introduce such uh, far-reaching uh, method of uh, regulating the gambling industry, like uh, in introducing the state monopoly. There was also no reason to believe why in the private uh, sector, both channels, online and land-based uh, channels, uh, in hands of the private operator, ensure the adequate level of protection for consumers, while in casino games, poker games, it's not the case. So probably for the next couple of years, until uh, all the pending cases in our administrative courts are not settled uh, with, with a final judgment, we will have some doubts whether the current regulation is fully compliant with EU law. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why there is no effective enforcement in Poland. Oh, thank you. Uh, I must mention that uh, we are also using the uh, blacklist of uh, blacklist of operators in Czech Republic. And then you mentioned that uh, what is happening in Poland is that uh, the operator simply puts a number onto into its website. Okay. So uh, I recently recently checked and I have found out that one uh, operator we already reached number three hundred in its uh, website that number. Yeah. And uh, yeah. of course, Czech government is bragging that they already effectively blocked so many websites, even if it's already it's mostly done by just few operators adding additional numbers. So the blacklisting yeah, it, is a very effective tool. In Poland, it's the same. This is all over 12,000 domain names already blocked. Yeah, actually, I have verified That's it good. today. It's 12,200 uh, nearly. Mm -hmm. So. Just one comment uh, which I would like to add to what Anna said is just uh, it's always one more factor, a time which the Polish uh, authorities needs to uh, have before uh, between the uh, day when they found about the domain in which needs to be blacklisted till the actually final um, blacklisted. It's like between a week or seven, even seven months, um, this data I found. So seven months, uh, it's a lot of time. So that creates an opportunity for the, uh, you know, uh, operators uh, from the mm. grain zone to just to operate during the seven months uh, easily. And then, like Anna said, open one more um, domain nearly identical to, uh, to the domain which was blacklisted. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, this is often what the regulation, which is not... Uh, being attractive uh, comparing to uh, comp comparing to players' demands actually force operators to do that quite inevitable. Anyway, we have very interesting question from the audience regarding the live dealer games in Czech Republic and Slovakia, and uh, the uh, players are actually wondering how come there are no accessible. Uh, Game uh, like dealer games, which are very popular recently, especially in the uh, and they are, I would say, one of the most popular online gambling games. So how come they are not accessible in the in the Czech Republic and Slovakia? Jan Robert, if you can comment on this. Yeah, definitely. So so when I was speaking about it, that in Czech Republic the regulation itself it, it's very open and all the forms of the games could be played. Uh, I think that live uh, dealer games is the only exception to this uh, case. It's actually not covered uh, precisely by the law. The, the law itself, Gambling Act, doesn't speak about the uh, live dealer games. But uh, we, we have the dialogue with the Ministry of Finance, which is the regulator in the Czech Republic, and we try to explain them that the live dealer fits to the existing category, which is described by the Gambling Act. But unfortunately, they are of the opinion that uh, it, it's not covered by the Gambling Act, and therefore it, it cannot be over. Uh, to the players, which I think definitely it's uh, it's a shame, because definitely is the sector or part of the gambling sector which is uh, popular for for the players, and and uh, I think the the clever regulator tried to keep uh, as big part of the gambling uh, market regulated and taxed rather than say it's not uh, within the regulation and therefore you cannot offer it. So. 
Still, we have this dialogue open with the Ministry of Finance. There is something which is called like ex post via or co public consultation with the, with the gambling industry stakeholders uh, who can deliver the messages which is not working in, in current regulatory framework. And definitely that would be one of the topics that we will raise uh, by the Institute for Gambling Regulation and try to uh, communicate to the Ministry of Finance that this type of the games definitely make a uh, big part of the market and should be licensed in the Czech Republic as well. Okay, Robert, what about Slovakia? Please un unmute your microphone. I'm afraid that you have it muted. I still can see it muted. Apologies. No. Perfect. Yes, in, so in Slovakia, uh, you know, the, the situation is uh, on uh, in in this aspect uh, is uh, slightly slightly different. I I believe uh, uh, there is uh, uh, there is uh, uh, you know uh, a different situation, and it's it's uh, more or less a matter of uh, time when you know there will be uh, there will be operators offering uh, offering this. Uh, product. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, Jakub, uh, what would you uh, advise to betting companies what they can do today so they can prepare for another possible lockdown or, and also if you can combine with the question whether there is something good from uh, what we can learn from the current situation around COVID uh, in terms of the betting industry. Well, actually, yeah, um, uh, it's hard to call it good, but in the toughest time, there were companies, not in Poland, that offered uh, bets on uh, gambling uh, on how many people would be infected per day, which could you can, of course, call uh, that is unfair or it should be not done, but they try to be creative, maybe not in a good way. But basically what it all showed us is that our world is very unstable. We used to grow in a world without a world in the Central Europe for more than a uh, 70 years and then uh, we realized that something big can happen also to us to our world that seemed like to be stable that seemed to be so well organized so first of all it's a show that uh, you have to think long term but you have to be also prepared to be very flexible and change your strategies in a very short time and i think this is something all of the companies have to think of second of all they need to go outside of their comfort zone because offering uh, sports betting to people that are used to sports betting and uh, expecting sports betting is easy. It's like selling uh, bread to someone who is hungry. Not a tough task. Of course, there are competitors, etc. But still, you're offering something that everyone expects you to offer. Now, you need to be more creative because offering sports that I mentioned is something new, something unexpected, and something that demands much more creativity. So definitely, it's like... Unfortunately, not a lesson we all wanted to have, but since we already have it, it's a good lesson for all of us to be more creative, more uh, prepared to change uh, our zones, and definitely to be uh, less uh, prepared to stay in the comfort zone. This is for sure. And definitely, um, we need to be prepared that uh, this fall can bring uh, much more sports uh, outage. Maybe not uh, to the extension that we uh, know from the spring, which was something never expected before and never uh, known before but definitely we need to be prepared for uh, some sport um, uh, outage and the thing is like all of these companies have to be prepared to offer not only traditional courses and not traditional betting but also betting on uh, unusual uh, events and events which are um, not in their offer right now so basically all about the creativity and all about also preparing your current uh, customers, current users, that uh, maybe your offer will be different. So it's all about the communication. I think now the communication is the key because also for the companies that struggle, that lost some of their customers, it's very important right now to be very uh, open with and very transparent with their communication and also try to ruin the people that used to bet uh, on their size, but for some reasons they moved uh, to their competitors uh, because of the tough times and the better offer from their uh, battles. So definitely very demanding time this fall, but still I think very promising and definitely um, this could be really a good time for betting even if the problems happen again. Okay, Anna. Uh, do you think that uh, the COVID has uh, any impact for the new types of, types of bets? 
Uh, for the new types of uh, new types of webs, yes, uh, I, I've seen that uh, bets on the weather forecast, for example whether tomorrow the weather will be between 23 and 20, 24 degrees or maybe between 25 and 26. So where there was no sport event, people would ha have to, to, to chance to bet on that. But what I really like is the new uh, type of games that, that, that is currently offered by three Polish operators. This is the bets on the results of simulated card games, including simulated poker. Mm -hmm. So you've got a live... Uh, a dealer uh, who is uh, just showing the cards in different uh, card games, poker, uh, the, the back red, and uh, the players, uh, the, the users can bet which what will be the next card, whether it will be black or red, whether there will be the number, or will be a pair. So this is really interesting for, from my perspective, because uh, as I mentioned, during the parliamentary discussion, when there was the decision taken that uh, the poker and the casino games must be in the hands of the state uh, monopoly, because the private operator cannot guarantee the adequate level of protection of consumers. I think that now allowing, permitting that, that, that type of games and uh, times will prove that the operators will have, I believe, no problems in, 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 in related to those live games. That could be a first step uh, to changing the regulation and allowing a wider scope of games uh, to be permitted to be offered by the private operator. So I think that could be one good thing uh, resulting from COVID. Okay, Eva, what do you believe will be the forecast for the poll and, and the, in the market considering the situation on the gambling market? Um, hmm. mm, I, in Poland as well as uh, in, the European, in, in the country of the European Union, the last few months have uh, seen a trend of ac uh, activating uh, online players. Um, we already discussed that. And um, I think that um, we also said that the Polish market is difficult for the private uh, operators. So there are some chances, uh, like Anna just mentioned, that uh, um, that um, somehow because in, in Poland only um, what's uh, what's. Uh, legal uh, when we are talking about uh, online uh, gambling it's only betting and promotion lottery lotteries so uh, and and not not um, on the uh, we have only one online casino which is total casino but it belongs to the state-owned company totalizator sportowe so um uh, like Anna mentioned, uh, the uh, the the uh, betting industry uh, needs to be very creative, of course, in the frame of uh, what is legal or and what is not legal uh, according to Polish Gambling Act. Uh, but uh, um, we also mentioned that the esport uh, is is growing. So I think that there are many possibilities, but they are not easy to find and. Um, Anyway, uh, I, I will give you also some piece of uh, information regarding the um, figures um, according to the Polish Ministry of Finance. So uh, it was just recently published that uh, by the Ministry of Finance that uh, uh, um, regarding the forecast for the uh, Polish Gambling Act uh, uh, market. Sorry. So uh, the forecast, uh, forecast is that this, there will be a decrease uh, of the Polish gambling market, but only a nine, um, minus nine and a half uh, percent, which is twice as low as, uh, as the uh, EU total, which is uh, 19, more than 19 percent. So, um, so it, it looks like that the Polish Ministry of Finance recognized that the situation, Poly situation in Poland is... Um, um, somehow better than in other European markets. So I think that uh, um, we can expect some um, better um, achievements, revenues regarding uh, Polish operators, um, maybe in the end of 2020 for sure, and maybe and uh, during the beginning of 2021. So um, cross, finger crossed for, for all operators. Okay, best of the luck as well. 
before I will ask you for your closing remarks, we have one more question from the audience asking uh, about the regulation of the advertising, especially affiliate marketing in Czech Republic and uh, Slovakia. So Jan Robert, once again, can you briefly, very briefly comment because unfortunately we are running out of time. Yes, so very briefly, uh, the affiliates as well as, well as uh, suppliers are not really, uh, the regulation is not very really common then. So basically there is no any specific regulation on affiliate marketing in the Czech Republic. Uh, there are some, some basic advertising uh, regulations speaking about the message that the advertising need to contain and, and it doesn't have it, it cannot be targeted minors and these kind of things which are quite usual around the Europe but any specific regulation on affiliate marketing is not in place and, and still comparing the regulation of the advertising and marketing in other jurisdiction, uh, the Czech Republic regulation is not very strict. So I think there is no big problem with affiliate marketing. Okay, Robert, what about Slovakia? That's the it's the same thing in, in Slovakia. So I think, you know, that's, uh, that's if, if to, uh, elevate one what advantage you know compared to some of the some of the larger markets these days uh, for now uh, you know there are no uh, big, big restrictions on advertising primarily of uh, online games but to be honest uh, I think uh, because we are following the, the other states with some uh, delay I think this will this will come but uh, it's it's not uh, imminent uh, yet so uh, for anyone would want to enter the market, you know, like uh, the sooner the better, you know, while you can while you can advertise because the moment, you know, you, you will have a lot of restrictions, uh, the market will become, you know, even less uh, attractive. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so we are running out of the time for our panel. So before we hand over the virtual podium to the next panel, I would like to all for and uh, ask you for any closing remarks very briefly. So Anna, why don't you start with uh, your view on the current situation and how, what do you expect that will be next? Well, uh, frankly speaking, I don't expect any changes in, in the coming years. However, I know which, uh, what will be the change uh, expected by most of the players, in, and not only the local players, but also from the offshore players. It would be the change of the uh, taxation in Poland from this 12% uh, turnover tax to the GGR. And that would be something that would effectively uh, channel the, 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 the customer, the players from all these unlicensed uh, websites to the licensed Polish operators. And uh, although I do not expect to hear many changes, that's the change that I would wish to come through. Okay, thank you. Eva, I know that you already mentioned your forecast about the Poland. Uh, is there something you would like to add? Um, I, I just would like to emphasize, like, uh, like I said before, I also don't expect that we'll, um, we will, that our gambling law will be amended uh, soon. Uh, the situation is stable and the Ministry of Finance uh, announced that he actually already beaten the gray market. Uh, which is actually somehow controversial uh, statement, uh, but um, according to that, uh, like I said, I don't expect uh, any significant uh, change. Um, so um, let's wait maybe for some uh, Supreme Administrative Court rulings, uh, which may um, add something to the interpretation of the gambling law um, in the end of 20, 2020 or at the beginning of 2021. Um, so I, I think that's it at, at this moment. Thank you. What about on the field of the sports betting, Jakub? Well, definitely, first of all, the change would be into making esports more popular, but definitely it will be also about uh, being more creative with the, the best that being offered. So basically not, not to limit the, the betting companies with the, what they are offering right now, but to be able to offer also something which is outside of uh, what they do. As some of them already do, they go into um, the uh, famous people uh, betting on their uh, activists, etc. So basically, we try to be creative. And of course, this is, uh, I think, a niche that can be explored much more. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, and what about Czech Republic? Any, any bright future you expect? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's hard to sum up uh, all the possible changes because currently it's really going on a lot here in Czech Republic. We had uh, the AML law and the gambling act last week debated in the parliament. Tomorrow there is another, another plenary session that will uh, be dealing with the gambling tax act. Uh, we have the list of excluded person, which would be launched in, in, in December. So there are like many changes and, and it's very hard to say what will be the outcome of the debates within the parliament and the Senate. But my personal view would be that uh, even if it stays as it is right now, I see the, the, the bigger interest of the foreign operators to enter the Czech market because even though uh, the, they cannot do registration by themselves, they can use the bank uh, for make the registration of the players on behalf of them. And I think because the market itself, it, it's very, very nice number. I think that uh, in uh, recent months and years, we will definitely see the more foreign operators to enter the Czech market and try their luck here. Sounds good. Sounds very good. So let's see that if it will actually go this way. Robert, Slovakia, any right expectations? Well, I, you know, I'm not so positive about the, the entry by, by new operators like in Czech Republic, uh, where I think is a, is a bigger chance with the chances. Uh, I think what will happen in Slovakia is, uh, you know, the online gambling share uh, will just be increasing more and more and the operators will, you know, try to focus uh, on, on that side of the business because of the reasons I mentioned, uh, all the limitations and prohibitions of land-based. So that will be, you know, going forward the only way for the, for the operators to really make money. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for very interesting debate which we had here on the electronic version of the gaming uh, of the uh, Gam gambling congress uh, this is it this is it for our uh, panel so thank you thanks everyone to who's, who's been watching this online for your attention i don't know if you, if i should ask for the round of applause for my uh, great panelists but maybe if you just hit the like button it will definitely help zoltan uh, for it's uh, for his future uh, interest, interesting uh, events. So that's it for us. Hope you find out something interesting about the Central Europe market. And uh, it, I'm handing over my word back to Zoltan. To yes, the new yes. Panel. So thank you, exactly. everyone. Thank you, thank guys. You. It was thank really great. Much. It was really great. Thank you. And, uh, thank and you, we, thank and you we will much. continue now. Bye, Dr. Jan. <laughs> or you can you can stay you can still stay for the next panel because this one is an interactive panel okay. discussion basically uh -huh. uh, where uh, first we will let the uh, moderator uh, moderate the panel <laughs> and uh, afterwards everybody can connect and uh, also add to the subject so Vasco I think you are here already yes I'm here Hi, hi, hi. I'm just uh, seeing uh, Stanislav joining, one of your panelists. Okay. I think they all quit. As soon as they found out it was me, they all decided not to come. Now they were here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> Nevertheless, we'll wait for them to come back. Okay, let's see. Stanislav is already here. Hi. Hi. Was on the comment about people joining and leaving immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thought uh, they're intruding on someone else's discussion. So. Yes. <laughs> Lubomira, can you hear Hello. us? Hello. Yes, Hi. do you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, let's see who else is online. Glenn has disconnected now. Norbert should be also here. I saw him somewhere. Okay, he will probably reconnect and then he says, well, okay, we, sh we should wait for them. Either way, there are five more minutes until we start. Maybe you guys can maybe share something from today. <laughs> <laughs> well, the anticipation for the call, I guess, and ho hoping that the technical difficulties are overcome. 
the technical difficulties have been overcome. Uh, it, I think I, uh, I am now about 50 years older after this half hour that I spent today fixing everything, but uh, it's working now much better than uh, as, as before. So we've been having a healthy stream for four and a half hours now. Uh, we are having lots of viewers on YouTube as well, so it's it's all good. Yeah, and you're on schedule, so that's good. Yeah, actually, that's, <laughs> that's very interesting. <laughs> that's good. I was not expecting this, I must say. Okay, I see that Dennis has also joined us. Let's ask him to unmute. Can you hear me? Hi, that is. I can so hear you and see you. <laughs> okay, so Glenn and Norbert are still missing. To be fair, they still have three minutes, so. Meanwhile, if someone knows how to sing or something, we can just wait while someone sings. <laughs> Glenn, Glenn is here. I am. Good to meet you all. Yes. Hi. Nice to to hear you and see you again. Hang on. Let's uh, let's get the video figured out here, and you can see me as well. There we go. Okay, and Norbert should be online soon as well. So as I told you before, Vasco, Vasco will, will, can, can start the panel and uh, go into the subject that you guys already put in the bullet points. And after that, we will have a, a 30 minutes interactive sessions with everybody who is here. They can also switch on their microphones and videos, add to this subject to make it more interesting because this, this discussion is, is basically put together to help each other. This is not about just having uh, everybody stating their talk, their points of view. We would like to have the points of view of the audience because I think uh, that 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 is missing from the conferences. It would not be possible at the li at the live conference. So basically, we now have the opportunity for everybody to add their inputs to this. And Vasco, I think you can already start. Yeah, let's 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 move on with this, and then I think meanwhile he will join us. And, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, there's time. There's time for everything. So I will now take over. Um, first of all, I would really really like to thank every every one of my speakers today, because I'm really really feeling humble to have them with me. It's really really a pleasure. Um, quite honestly, uh, as soon as I saw the panel, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm happy because I'm I'm having rock stars of the industry in my in my panel. So I'm thank you all for being here. It's really a humbling experience. Um, I'll try not to talk too much. Uh, I know people want to hear you, not me. So I'll make this clean and smooth on my side. I really just want to pick your brains a little bit about the topics that we are we are approaching today. And basically, uh, just to wrap it up in terms of topic, it's it's all about the latest industry innovations, and it's all about how we are adapting to current times. We know things are different. We know for sure that 2020 was still is uh, being quite a uh, very challenging year for, for, for everyone. And, and because of everything that happened, I know we're all sick and tired of talking about COVID, but it's, it's uh, well, it, it did change our, our, our landscape and, and the way things are right now. So I'm basically going to explore a little bit uh, what's out there in terms of new challenges, in terms of innovations, and, and uh, how can we improve and how are you guys improving and, and, and bringing new stuff to the table in terms of player, player retention, player retention, and all those 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 innovations that we 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 can all share here our own um, experience as well. You can, not me for sure. Um, I will now briefly introduce just my my panel just to let you know that I know who you are. 
So I did my homework. Now we have Stanislav Silin here with us, which is the CEO for Avaltenar. Thank you for being here. We have Denis Talikis as well, CEO of Fantasy Sports Interactive. We have our lovely lady Lubomira Petrova from Ultraplay, the Chief Marketing Officer. Thank you for being here. Uh, Thank we have you. Nor Norbert Mathis, the Managing Director, which I'm not sure if he's here already, from Spermatic Entertain Me, Entertainment, uh, and Glenn Bullen from Dow Group. Thank you all very, very much for uh, for being here. And I think I'll, I won't delay anymore. I think we can start talking about the, the topics that we, we, we spoke. And my first uh, introduction to this would be related to product innovation and, 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 and user experience as, as, we've, as we've approached before. Um, I've heard the other panels, I think more or less we've, we've talked about a little bit about this, but in terms of how do you guys think for your own experiences, for your know-how, for the companies you work with, uh, for your own companies, um, how do you see product innovation and, and how enhanced user experience will actually benefit consumers? And how do you think and how do you feel if this will be actually the driver for future player retention? If, if, if we are really dependent on this innovation, on this capability of ourselves to adapt to this new reality, to new realities that might come um, in the future. I'm doing a general question. So any one of you, if you want to, to, to say something about it. Is that a question based on the current post or during COVID environment <laughs> or is it a generic question? I mean, are we talking about the last six months, the last 12 months? I That's would place right now the question as in a more generic way. We'll, we'll go in depth in terms of COVID uh, okay. later on, but for now, just to have a general view of what you guys think. Uh, well, more generically, I'm sure if you've noticed the, the Facebook changed their UX considerably this year. I mean, LinkedIn has done that recently. Uh, we, we're not an a B2C ourselves, but we see what our operators do. A lot of them are trying to build their image of their of, of their user experience in line with that design style, uh, light, you know, the um, um, minimalistic, but really it, our desktop experience has become a big mobile experience. So it's not new. It's not that something that happened exactly in 2020, yeah. but maybe with the big uh, social networks out there doing this facelift, that's also coming to our industry. Generically, now we can maybe listen to someone else from their perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, please share your own experience because we have different areas here. We have esports focused companies, we have fantasy sports. We, we, so we'd like to hear all of your inputs in, in your specific areas. How do you see it? I would like to say that, um, for instance, these current times, because they are completely unprecedented for all of us, uh, we would like to see them as a room of opportunity to the business. And so businesses can be agile, they can uh, use this uh, opportunity uh, and adapt it to their products. Um, of course, product innovation and user experience is uh, at the cornerstone, I can say, for every business. So that can uh, differentiate from the others, they can um, like uh, offer something ahead of the market demand. Um, but it's uh, really easy to speak when you have uh, a product that uh, is alive when, uh, for example, other products weren't uh, during these times. Uh, of course, um, in terms of esports, because I can really talk about that as uh, Ultraplay is a uh, leading esports betting provider, a lot of user experiences involved there because um, the target audience is used to uh, Twitch, it's used to some social media and esports itself, the, game, the games itself, they have really strong uh, user experience and they are really attractive uh, to, to their users. So when you offer it on your website, you really need to offer it the right way with the right tools, with the right representations, uh, etc. Very well. Um, it, you mentioned. I will probably just jump on a little bit on, on my on my question because I think this makes sense in regarding what you said. Um, since you're, you're focused on, on esports, for instance, and this is, was another topic that I think it could be interesting here. It's in terms of how, how do you guys, um, do you have the, the um, young generations uh, in your mindset when you're developing something new, when you're trying to bring something new to the table in terms of product innovation, in terms of bringing new challenges to the, to the market? Um, 
what role does this young generation plays? Is it still, uh, is it already something it's in your minds? Because we're talking about fantasy sports, esports, virtual sports. We we usually tend to think about the younger generations, or at least, uh, well, some some of them are already not not so young anymore. But but we're thinking with that mindset is is probably what we, we what we have in place. Do you guys have that in mind in terms of younger generations? How to adapt the games and how to adapt the way you deliver the the the, the products to 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 the operators uh, yes sure but i think about of what you mentioned uh, because when we started uh, offering esports uh, it was six years ago we actually the team um, uh, who started uh, who started it uh, they're young uh, and uh, the whole company is um, uh, combined from young people uh, so they actually are gamers and they like playing um, ver they like playing uh, games uh, so they started uh, firstly by their um, uh, initial interest uh, to to offer something new it was born like a new idea and you know that innovation actually is uh, this to have a new idea new concept uh, something that interests you and you think that can be of use to uh, the end users. Uh, as a marketeer, I can say that uh, most of the users, they don't know what uh, they want until you give them the product. So um, uh, we started this earlier um, and uh, developed it. Uh, to be honest, um, it was um, considered reliable, risky, uh, from uh, what my colleagues uh, explained back then. For example, uh, our now CEO Mario Vcharov was the first uh, person to actually trade the CSGO live trade. Uh, back then, um, there were few people to bet on CSGO, but now you can see, especially with this uh, situation, that it was became more than a hype. It was uh, it it became uh, an alternative uh, betting vertical, and it actually uh, saved uh, like the betting volumes for many operators uh, for those uh, past few months. Actually, a question here because you you're obviously more of an expert in esports than perhaps us. I'm not sure about others, uh, but um, what's your top esports um, product? As in which sport, which uh, game? Uh, which game you mean? Um, so the top three titles that um, are most bet on are CSGO, Dota 2 and League of Legends. Uh, they were... Yeah. I specifically asked you that question because uh, obviously during coronavirus times, when what, we go, we talk about half, second half of March, April, uh, May, nothing was on except for the Russian League or table tennis, right? <laughs> and uh, esports was, or the virtuals were the two channels to, or the two content um, replacements you could you could go for. And you know what really worked for us? None of those, uh, from the ones you mentioned, uh, FIFA and uh, soccer uh, esports, which maybe is particular to our demographic, maybe particular to the territories we're serving, but. To be honest, we haven't discovered this uh, uh, League of Legends or uh, Counter Strike. You should yet. definitely try them or add mm -hmm. more markets there, because uh, yeah. uh, from the genius or from from ESL of of, of Sport mm -hmm. Radio, it was actually quite a, a good blend of of, of content from uh, from various uh, looks like industry leading sources or, or or venues or or championships that were there. But still, clients still went on, on the traditional, on the soccer. What's, yeah, what's sure. Uh, like uh, you mentioned, those titles also performed very well. But um, pre-COVID, um, those three titles were really strong. They are the giants in esports. Everyone who is aware of esports, watch or play or bet on it, uh, they know the games and they know the rules. And this younger generation, they uh, really tend to um, the skills or knowledge-based gambling. So uh, they're more focused to go there. For example, if your players or operators are more focused to sports, 
it's uh, logical to be transferred or shifted to the um, uh, sports uh, simulators like FIFA, as you mentioned. But for operators who already have this uh, uh, core audience of esports betters, those three titles are the top. Uh, I think, uh, Stanislav, I think the important thing is to where the operators offering their products because in Europe, soccer is the main event. And as I have the insight, I think most of the people were playing Latvia soccer, you know, because it was uh, still on. So, and... Uh, I or Belarus. Or Belarus. Yeah. Belarus. Exactly. But uh, we saw the issues about the NBA 2K, you know, especially in sports, they have a lot of issues. So I think uh, esports for Europe, if we say for Europe, they have uh, kind of future, but let's see how it goes in the next couple of years. Because as we say for Europe, soccer is the main event. And uh, as you discussing before Vasco about uh, about the UX experience, I think we have to add that the important and the crucial thing to the new products or the products that we try to deliver to the operators is to have as much data as they can so the bettors to feel comfortable when they place their bet, especially at this challenging period, as you said, because we're going to see, and I think in the next uh, half of the year, or, you know, uh, last quarter, that the average spending of the better will go less. So we have to take extra care what uh, products we're going to offer to them. And so to be more comfortable. But uh, the people that, you know, you said that they are young, as you know, they are want to have more access. They want to have more skin in the game. So that's why they have huge distractions to a lot of products like we are offering. But yeah, that was actually that was actually one of the reasons why I thought this this could be a very interesting topic because when you see uh, from someone I mean we, we provide obviously for 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 most of you guys but when you see from the outside you can see arenas being completely full with well pre COVID uh, <laughs> full with people to watch uh, FIFA tournaments to watch CS:GO tournaments. And, and that, that's why I thought, okay, this, is this having any kind of impact or any reflection on actually on the betting, on, on the betting side, on the gaming side, on our industry? Uh, does one thing relate to the other? And, and that's why I think this could be actually a very interesting topic. And, um, and I guess one, one of the topics that we, we, we brought here already, a couple of, a couple of you guys, was in terms of uh, key uh, innovations you guys actually see coming up. Because I know this is a completely different way of betting. I know this is a completely different way, or at least the way I see it is not the same as typical sports betting. So is this a natural development? Is this like the next natural step? Or is this something that will go along with traditional sports betting? Because eventually now all the all the sports are coming back. All the, the, the well, limited in terms of stadiums, in terms of having people there, but you have the games, you can still bet. Is, does this come hand in hand? Are you expecting that this virtual gaming, this virtual sports is actually the next step? They will come along? How, how, how do you see this? Or do you see this as an innovation itself or just another part? Of the of the industry, if any of you wants to, I don't know. I, well, I'm I, I'm not from the esports side of things <laughs> at all. But if if you think back to what now feels like years ago when we were all at ICE in February, and they had the esports um, arena, I guess, um, yes. off in the corner uh, of the Excel, and I was amazed. Our booth was quite close by, and it was packed absolutely packed all day with people watching this but the funny thing was around the outside it was it was like i don't want to be i don't want to say it this this sounds denigrating but it was almost like people watching like looking in a zoo or something like it was all the the hard you know the the traditional gaming people around the outside all sort of agog watching what was going on with the people who were in the inside it was two completely different um groups and demographics and, and age grades and all of that watching the two it was it was a i thought the the rim around that arena was a really interesting blend between the two sides and whether whether it would always be that way and you know esports would be something complementary and it would run in parallel or whether you know a year or two three down the line we'd see that 
merge together if we're ever back in the Excel Center having a, a huge conference again. But you know whether you would see it it, it amalgamated into the the more mainstream. It was it was I thought it was a really interesting uh, visual watching that that uh, that occur over the the course of the, uh, the yeah, event. Yes, I, I was there and I felt that and that that that's why I've actually brought this asshole to the table. I mean, it it seems like two worlds apart. But at the same time, they're not. I mean, the, 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 we were all under the same building, so we, we were all experiencing the same thing. Pascal, well, were you compelled to join the action or were you compelled to better? <laughs> I think I'm on that stage that I feel too old to join the action. Uh, so maybe I'll just I'll just stay on the outside, just watching. I'll be one of those. Were you compelled <laughs> to bet on it? <laughs> I'm probably compelled to bet on it, not to play. No, but it's it's you know it's really all of these are actually interesting topics because I I, I do think that um, when we talk about product innovation probably the way you guys search for new ideas and new 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 products and you develop new products and, and for your for your for your operators I think it always comes in in, in mind to 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 bet on this 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 new well they're not so new anymore but the on this fantasy esports and, and all these areas that I, I think are actually taking taking their space I'm not saying they are replacing they're taking their space and um, and this is actually a question that I, I would like to ask Glenn is um, I had specifically for you, but, but this one, I think, when you think about innovation, as we were saying, and uh, in terms of uh, player retention and acquisition, uh, if you can tell me in your view, what do you think are the, the, the key innovations that we've seen in the last year? And if you can fit somewhere there, this esports and this fantasy world in, 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 um, in those innovations? Well, I can't. Um, <laughs> but I can, I can, I can. I'm pretty I sure that this will disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, uh, Dell Group is a is a group of companies that are, that are pretty uh, not a group of companies, a group of, group of partners with product lines, and Dell Wallet is the main the main product line, which is a crypto fiat gateway, and that's that's the main side of things. So, but I'm not going to go down any crypto avenue because I come from 20 years in the iGaming space, and that's, that's the focus. So for me, um, crypto is just another B2B product that, that uh, you know, fits within the needs of, of operators and platforms in iGaming. And, and the one thing that I've noticed through this year is, a, is an increasing pace of operators and platforms reaching out to us and saying, what they require. I've never, you know, nobody likes to sit on a panel and have somebody pitch product. So I'm not going to do that, but I'm not going to speak about, you know, others in the industry. I don't have the visibility on them, but in my time in the industry, I've never seen a company that's more focused on what the requirements are that are incoming. It, it's not building a product and then pushing it out into the market and saying, this is, this is the brilliant thing that we've done. Do you want it? Um, and I've had probably more, I, I would say definitely had more interesting and detailed conversations with operators coming to us and saying, this is exactly what we require for this market that we're now moving into, especially when sports ended and everybody started looking for the next big place they wanted to move into. Um, you know, they're looking for, for player acquisition and, and crypto users sit in a really appealing demographic of, you know, 25, 45 with good disposable income ready to utilize new technology. So that's very appealing for them. And they want to figure out how to bring that on board. And everybody's trying to figure out how you can keep your players engaged and crypto doesn't care, you know, there's no chargebacks that you get instant payments. So the players really like that. The operators really like that, but it's just that that product innovation is all very much end user driven in this, in this sector and in other companies that I've been within gaming, I've never seen that dialogue occurring to the degree that it's happened not so much initially in the year, but as as lockdown increased and you know when sports ended and, and people really started to to scramble to figure out how they were going to make up for that loss and then where it would take them next. Um, the conversations have been entirely driven by the operators coming in and saying, this is exactly what's required of us. Can you support us? Rather than just us as a B2B supplier shopping a product out into the market. And that's been a really interesting um, experience for me. Did you see an uplift of, of customers to your crypto gateway specifically during the, the lockdown period? 
well, my entire time with the company has been during the lockdown period. So I can't, <laughs> and we launched the wallet in, in April. So, you know, right into it, right into the, 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 the there's no right way of the, before and after. <laughs> there's no, there's no before and after, but it was certainly, you know, as soon as we launched and started getting the message out, people, uh, you know, operators and platforms coming to us and saying, you know, we are scrambling here and some who weren't. Some who are, I think were really caught on the back foot and, and weren't able to adapt quickly, but um, it is certainly from that point of launch in April through now has just been an ever increasing dialogue and, and, and inflow of, of operators contacting us about what their requirements are and can we meet it. And uh, I don't think they're getting that from other suppliers and, they're, and so it's increasing on our side, which is always beneficial. It's, it's a very interesting thing because uh, I think I remember Lomir was talking about sometimes uh, operators or clients, they don't really know what they need. So they're probably expecting you guys uh, to, this is a question as, at the same time, are they expecting you guys to come up with these new alternatives or because at some point they were left like, okay, we lost our core market. So are they looking for you guys to look for? Okay, do you have alternatives? What do you have left? Or what do you have in your, in your portfolio that you can actually propose so we can actually go ahead with it? Um, are they lost in that, in, that, in that sense? Or do they come to you and say, okay, guys, this is what I want. This is what I need. Do you have something for me like this? Well, I had an interesting experience on that. Sorry, Lubyanka, go, go ahead. <laughs> the, the poor old I just wanted here. to agree with you, Glenn because uh, it also happened to us uh, during the uh, lockdown as well. Many operators come, came to us asking um, what can eSports do for us? Um, what games, uh, how players bet? Many, many questions. So I can uh, totally understand uh, your experience because we also do uh, this uh, approach towards our clients, uh, we are adaptive, flexible, and uh, take into consideration their needs, of course. Uh, but when we speak about uh, innovation, this is something that comes up from a new, new idea, concept that um, wasn't there before. And you take this risk, of course, uh, to establish it on the market. And uh, then you start building your product year by year. And now six years later, we can definitely say that uh, eSports is not uh, something um, small or uh, how to say people don't know about it. I've heard, for example, in this conference, uh, people from many markets talked about eSports from uh, uh, like legal perspective as well. This is something that never happened before before COVID. So it was a really, uh, how to say, um, alternative topic during the conference before COVID. Now we are talking more and more about these sports. Um, There's a, the, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, please, please. Yeah, I was just, just to compliment on the topic of uh, the operator hasn't got a clue and is asking you for advice, as, as you eloquently put it. <laughs> I think that um, to relay this to Glenn's comment on you don't really do a product in vacuum and then you pitch it out there and you hope that customers will eat it. I know our experience is that it's always a response to some ground knowledge that comes from the operator in that particular region and you as a provider try and do your best maybe you do it differently so it fits your technological needs or it fits you or you have a different perspective from a different market so that one solution fits both or is more elegant but i don't think you you normally try and break the ground uh, by creating something totally different than than no one wants <laughs> it's, it's early adoption i can disagree with you stanislav uh, it's more about the business model if you want to do something innovative or you just want to copy or just want to add something more. It's more about perspective and uh, how you see uh, your company growth. And um, well, you know, this is my personal opinion. I touch with the operators. I, I think that most of the operators, they don't want innovative products. They want successful products. 
Yes. So, uh, first of all, because we are a B2B software house, everyone, I think we have to do a sales. So we have to make uh, a challenge and uh, you know convince them that we have uh, a proof of concept, that we have good KPIs, and this product going to have a good results to them. And we have to have different products with different, you know, uh, you know, approach according to where the operators, you know, make his money. So, <laughs> how many of us do B two C? Huh? Own customer base, own player acquisition. Because if that's the case, that's where you probably can experiment here and there. But if you're pure B two B, can you really experiment on your on your customers in a way that is uh, potentially damaging? You cannot experiment at all with your customers. Uh, at least I don't have, uh, you know, this flexibility. I don't know if anyone else has. But at I agree. Least the situation is different. <laughs> Let's say we have it partly. <laughs> I would be actually my next question would be for Norbert uh, in terms of if you could have uh, because I know so far we've been focusing a little bit on sports betting and all this, but in terms of casino games because it's. Uh, it's a little bit different, uh, and probably the reaction to the market and to everything that happened, and uh, and how you you can be innovative or let's call it whatever or product development. In your case, how do you how do you see this, all this? It's it's uh, you can be partly innovative, but um, as uh, Stanislav and Dennis mentioned already, in a in a in a, in a good way, um, you need to take care of uh, of the needs of your customer, and you need to see where is he where is he earning his money and uh, you need to develop your products towards these parameters. But we as a casino, as, as, as casino product providers are, are a bit more flexible and we have, uh, we have a, a more broad range to, to, uh, to be innovative, to create new games, to create uh, new stuff, to create new things for these uh, specific uh, areas. Like, I did think you, did you notice? Give it to the operator in a way that the operator can use the way they you want without affecting their existing product. You give a new game, they can take it, they can use it, they can. No, there is, there is a specific lifetime. It's not like a betting product. If you have, a, as for example, a slot game, a slot game has a, has a, has a lifetime of uh, two or three months, which is which is um, where this where this game, if it's not Starburst, is really effective and is earning money. In, in specific areas. Um, so yes, you can, you, you, you have a bit more of, uh, um, if, if one title is not that successful than the last one, yes, who cares really? Um, the next one will, 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 will grip it up and will, will take it. Um, so there is, uh, there is more space for innovation, real innovation, uh, specifically if it comes to mechanics, if it comes to mass models, you can even, even use or abuse uh, your, your operators as beta testers and see if, uh, if your titles are working well in, in, in these areas. And so you can uh, develop towards this direction or towards this direction. That means for us, it's a bit more, yes, we, we have a bit more flexibility. We can, we can go different ways. We can mm -hmm. go, yes, more innovative ways. We can also go more innovative ways in, in, uh, in, um, Checking what what are our competitors are doing, what is uh, what is uh, what is at the moment in the in the in the trend, what uh, what are the, the people are running after specifically. So you can uh, start to develop your own ideas, your own your own products towards these directions as well. To not use uh, copy or clone names, etc. Well, one of the things that I, I um, obviously when, when, when this topic came along, um, I obviously did some research and I was looking, okay, let me see, not try not to make look like a fool to these guys and seem like I know a lot of this. No, but jokes aside, I, you look a lot of concepts. So when you start to look about innovation in what comes to iGaming and, and, and our industries and AI, you talk about virtual reality, you talk about augmented reality, you have a bunch of big, big names and scary names. But the question in this case would be how much, um, one of the things that they talk is mobile, okay, mobile is pretty much implemented, but 
is it really realistic? And I'm talking sports betting or new games, and I think in the broad scale, uh, is it really realistic to think about all these innovations, all these new high tech realities that are every day more in, in our in our day to day life? to be implemented in this industry? Is it really realistic to consider this in product development, in, 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 in new solutions to the market? Or so far the innovation is not trending to this AI, to this virtual, to this augmented reality. How do you guys see all these this, this big names? I think you know, if you offer innovative products, you have to give the time to the to the customers, to the operators, to adapt it. So even that we have, you know, I think that a lot of our B2B companies have innovative products, we have to be realistic and see when we have to offer it and give some time, you know, to educate the customers. So to educate the customers, you need uh, uh, good operators with a good marketing campaign. So even that you say all of this, you have to have a, a time to market and uh, a realistic uh, behavior, how you can this offer it to your end customers. So this is very crucial. Yeah, so it's all about the timing or, or where you do it. Yeah, so because example, if you, uh, we have a lot of innovative products, but uh, you have to take into account this uh, coronavirus situation. So better to take some time and then to invest on 2021, which I hope that are gonna be a very successful year for all of us. And uh, first of all, healthy and then successful. And uh, let's see, you know, the innovation next year. And how do you mass monetize some of these? I mean, you know, do you really see global adoption of, of uh, AI or VR across all of the markets? And, and you know, is that really the push to it? it, it is it just a, is it just the shiny spoon? You know, the little, the attractive little thing off on the side that's a bit of a distraction from everything else, but I can't see, just from my perspective, either one of those really making a huge impact on, on the revenue driving side of it all. You know, it's certainly not in, in, in betting and casino side of it all, possibly in esports, it might be quite wild to be in a headset being a part of shooting without a game, answering, but, you know. Without answering your question directly, I think one of the approaches could be, I mean, gaming industry is not the biggest industry in the world. You can always get a bit of a cheat sheet of how other industry have done it and say uh, well, other online services let's take Amazon or let's take uh, well any larger e-commerce or banking or telecommunications industry did they use any of this AI successfully was there any augmented reality that has gone really um, so successful and I think that would be the answer will it really be adopted in uh, in the gaming industry as well there is obviously a place for AI, for sure there is. Uh, whether that is uh, going to be the killer feature, I guess it depends on, on how the other, uh, how the, the, the customer base is already going to be used to it in their day-to-day -day banking apps, in their day-to-day -day shopping apps, because the gaming isn't going to be their first consumption. <laughs> It, it makes no, no, no gaming company is going to be the first to be distributing that either. They're not. They're not that progressive. So the, you're that, you're right. The the adoption is going to come from from other sources. That, that was why that was why the question. Uh, I mean, because you can see a lot of concepts and people throwing uh, names and concepts to the table. But then when you look in reality, uh, it's uh, in my in my perspective. That's why I wanted your opinion. It didn't seem very, very uh, realistic in terms of product development to, to focus on this. Maybe AI is a different thing because probably we're all one way or the other using AI. But uh, for all the rest, it seemed a little bit far, far fetched. I mean, AI has very some well documented techniques of pattern analysis and uh, that, that that are definitely useful for let's say helping individuals do their jobs better. And when we're talking about of a mass stream of content or transactions, there is definitely a place for AI. Now, I'm not so sure that augmented reality is there right now as something that's going to make this industry explode. Anything that's more of a buzzword at the moment, in my opinion. And, but AI, yeah, it's, it's recognizable. It's, uh, if, if you have the right solid computer science background within your teams to actually make good use of it, and there is high performance uh, computing understanding, 
Definitely. Maybe. Good man. <laughs> Uh, in, terms, in terms of esports, um, uh, this question is: but Do you do you think that esports somehow will be the 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 first, or they will be the first to to implement any of these changes, or you really don't see it as realistic for now? And, and, and if there is any difference between esports and, 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 and conventional betting and conventional casino? Uh, yes, sure. There, there, there are differences uh, between different betting verticals. Uh, but what I can see is that um, uh, there are also innovation in the casino, and I'm, uh, I agree with Norbert that uh, they they have this flexibility as well. They also do some very interesting concepts um, like the uh, gamification elements or. Uh, something that excites the players because I think uh, for our industry uh, the the key part is entertainment. Uh, we entertain players uh, and uh, they expect something uh, unexpected. Let's say that way because I think that uh, they are already way well aware of the brands of the operators, also of the games of the. Um, uh, products, uh, also of the suppliers, they, they already know which suppliers uh, offer that product or services. So I think uh, our main focus should be how to excite uh, the end user, how to offer them something different, because as Stanislav said, um, gambling industry kind of follows um, other bigger industries. Uh, we, we also see like uh, uh, AI already into our lives with chatbots or with, with some other tools. So it's a matter of time to be more seen in the gambling industry as well. Very well. I promised I wouldn't bring COVID too much to the table, but it's, 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 I think these days it's almost impossible. <laughs> so I'll just briefly just, I know we've said this before, but just to, to as a matter of, as a, for the sake of context, um, for you guys is, um, can we also say that in the gaming industry and in the gambling industry, there was a pre-COVID and post-COVID, and we're talking about two different realities. So you cannot say, okay, how is the game, how is the industry going? Uh, or you can say it, but until COVID and after COVID. So are these two realities actually, when you feel on your daily lives, on your customers, on the way you develop, is does does it really have a, a real impact on, on how you think about your companies, how you think about your products? Did it really have that impact? Definitely, yeah. And and I mean, we can't see post COVID yet, so that's that's we can we can discuss in the midst of it all COVID. Um, and one of the things that surprised me the most is how many companies we've been working with who haven't been able to adapt to the work from home. And, uh, and and just from the, I don't know, maybe the disassociation of their people. I mean, we've had uh, companies stop contract progress because they can't, they won't do any hiring while everybody is not working out of the head office and they're short legal staff. So they've stopped all contracts with all suppliers. Um, we've had product launches that have stopped because the operator, operators who haven't gone live, new operators who refuse to go live because all of their tech teams are all working from home. Um, other ones who won't do any integrations and they're stopping everything across the board until everybody, It's it's been a really jar, I think it was a, a very jarring experience for a lot of companies that spent many years focused on their company culture and everybody in the office and everybody in there, we're all working together, we're open constantly, whatever you did. And suddenly now that people were working from home and they were having their virtual meetings by Zoom and they were using Slack and they were using, um, uh, telegram and all these new technologies that were suddenly brought in in order to get things done and I had a number of them that just stopped dead in the water and that was really really surprising to see happen and they seemed to do it with a bit of a hmm. you know yeah we're not high, we're not uh, we're not completing any contracts right now because we haven't hired any new staff and I thought and like how, how is that why is that the position that you've stopped at like surely you should be saying we're scrambling. We're getting them. We're getting this done. Just give us a couple of weeks, and we'll we'll have this on. It was just a bit of a, eh, you know, and, a, and another one that that put off their launch for 
God, it must be six, seven months now before they've launched and they still haven't gone live because they're not comfortable without everybody being together in the office. I think that's that's been quite extraordinary. So companies that can't adapt as we move into hopefully what will be post-COVID and, and that will be post-COVID continuum, not post-COVID and then we start this process all over again. But you know, if we do go into another winter lockdown and people who have gone into the office and that companies have picked themselves back up, but then everybody is back into lockdown and back from working from home. These companies cannot afford to just keep grinding to a halt every time that the dynamic within their, their working environment stops. And so I think any of them that suffered from that here as we move into post-COVID, you would hope would look back on that and go, wow, like we sure didn't adapt to that situation the way that we would have imagined we would have under, you know, uh, on with a, with, you know, sort of viewing it without the experience. So, you know, and then we'll adjust, but uh, that's been a, that's been an extraordinary experience and, and sort of insight into, into companies I found during this process, during the past, you know, what are we at now? Nine, nine months of it all, eight months of it all. So that's kind of, it's even an opportunity for those who, who reacted and who adapted. Uh, this will be a game changer because those who didn't will be left behind and those who did will probably be successful from now on because they were able to adapt to this new, to this new reality. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about this. But everyone has to adapt for the situation, you know, especially because this is going to continue for at least six to nine months. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, very challenging. I don't think that you can replace work from office with work from home, especially for people that uh, they're working for first time, they're young, like 24, 25. You can, if you lose, you know, all this collaboration, all this agile that we have invested everyone, you know, in this, I think uh, you're going to lose a lot of time. But, you know, it's time that uh, a lot of people can uh, invest, you know, and, uh, you know, now have innovative products. I think, you know, because this gives you time, at least, you know, and we saw that we have increased our sales because uh, people had time to do some business development that previous year they didn't have. Very well. I think one of, one of the, a couple of you just mentioned two, two, two things that I think that are interesting here, which is flexibility and, uh, and adaptation. And my next uh, topic would be actually regarding uh, how much you, you guys need to be prepared to offer your clients platforms that are actually flexible, that are actually customizable. And so you can, you can deliver the products in such a diverse landscape where we're talking about different markets, different languages, how much you, you guys feel that you have this flexibility to have this customization, this adaptation uh, on your platforms is key to, to, to be able to deliver a good product to the, to the market. To any of you, I'll let you any of you to answer. I will be the first one because it looks like it does point to me, but <laughs> I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. <laughs> no, but it's it's really it's really my my no, but for real, my question would be it's really um, the flexibility and... part. The flexibility part to me makes makes some sense. I'll try to relate to this to to, to Norbert's uh, this illustration of of innovation of the games. And, and where, why is that more flexible than having, you know, a single product? So first of all, uh, a slot provider has the luxury of selling to everybody. <laughs> so, so a game that's not successful, they just move on. A sports book provider, you get one chance of getting it into a particular customer there. You know, you really have to cater for all, for all their needs. Now what's there in between? Well, we've just recently engaged on a journey with something which detaches the content from the main client into widgets that then the operators can use as their, uh, with their own particular experience, like what uh, casino game would it plugs in into, into their, uh, into their interface, into their front. And maybe that is the flexibility that gives the tools to the operator to, you know, to adapt in any way. And, actually relating to a previous comment you mentioned, because I also remembered about that, was about gamification. Uh, we have seen some very successful operators who are successful in driving customers to absolutely new brands that did not exist before without massive sponsorships to, you know, to sports teams with something unique. And that something unique is a feature that their affiliates take, 
man managed to promote, and that in many times is this experience on the portal, the gamification. So as a provider's duty is to give them tools so they can do anything they like. Therefore, if we can give them the content in the most versatile way that they can use to build their own experience without us building it for them, they will be much more grateful for it and they will be able to do their job best. Well, I can relate to that because I'm a victim of gamification myself. So yes, I, I, I can relate to, to, to gamification. Um, some, some other topic that was, was raised before, and uh, I think we can now go in a little bit in that. It's in terms of the regulatory restrictions and this cross-border multi-regulatory landscape and um, how risky it is to develop products and how risky it is to bring products to the table when you have such distinct regulations per market, per country, if, is, does this impact any of your, of your product development, any of your projection to the future in terms of what you're thinking about for, for the market? Does regulation have an impact in all that? I think this has a, 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 a very big impact into, into all of our businesses. Um, but I think also this, uh, these regulations are uh, one of the key drivers of the so-called innovations, because uh, you need to adapt to, uh, to new requirements, which are not given from an operator, but from a, from a, from a legal, uh, from a governmental uh, uh, position away, and uh, which, which, which giving you the opportunity, because you need to see it like this, um, to evolve your products according to these ones. Um, we will see, uh, uh, I just can talk about, about uh, the casino business. From the casino side, we will see a big drive in, in innovation in the next few months if it comes to, uh, to specifically to slot games. Because in, uh, there are a few new regulations coming up in, uh, in the United Kingdom and in Germany, which will drive us to and, and which will require a lot of new innovations. There will be a spin length from five, from a minimum of five seconds in Germany. This will be very challenging for uh, all, all casino game providers, as uh, everybody will get bored from five second spins. It's uh, incredible, and it's uh, up to now. It's uh, we, we cannot we cannot even think on 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 on, on really good and great solutions how to solve it. But for sure, we will have great solutions because we need to. Um, as, uh, as our market is, uh, is, mainly, is mainly heading towards these directions, because if you need to, you will do. Um, this, uh, yes, this is, uh, this is my point of view into, into these regulations. We see it as a, as a key driver in innovation, because if you don't, if you're not forced to, if you don't need to move your ass, you will not ask, you will, you will not move it. Um, so either the operators will, will move us or, the, or the, the regulators will do it. Again, oh, you you know. a destructive innovation. <laughs> <laughs> it, it breaks the player experience of, of the slot game. No, we, you will, we, will, we will come up with a, with, a, with, a, with a real great experience. I'm, I'm sure of it. We will see. Belgium with dice slots? Yes. Uh, how how, how clever region. is that, is it? <laughs> yes. I don't know if uh, anyone else wants to add something else in uh, about these restrictions and these regulations. You know, first of all, we are doing innovative products, and then we try to convince the regulators that they are legal. You know, I think that is the route. I don't know any other route, to be honest. You know, at least the last ten years. Uh, but um, from my latest experience, I think especially with US regulators that we have came across the last two months, I think now because all of the of this of the coronavirus, so to say that, I think they are going to be more flexible because uh, you know licenses uh, are a revenue stream for each state. So I think that we have to take advantage of this time and we have to convince the regulators for our products. I think this is a challenging period for us. And I so, think uh, the most important, uh, how can I say, obstacle for uh, operators is the, that they have to overcome the advertising restrictions. 
I think, you know, because in Greece we have a new, a new law, a new regulation, now in Germany, that we study a lot. And uh, they're going to have uh, a lot of issues with their marketing campaign, how to get uh, new clients, how to have, you know, and I think that's a lot of, a lot of the companies now they're going to invest, like Skybet five, six years ago, they're going to invest a lot to skill games. I think this is going to be a quick route. Okay, so, so it is a cornerstone of product development, this regulation and the restrictions and, and, and all that. I don't know how it is for esports, Lebomir, if it's any different, or if you feel the same way about it as, as all the others. Yeah, sure, uh, as uh, in any other vertical. What I can say is that, uh, of course, regulation is uh, like at the center of uh, our industry. If you want to establish your product to as many or some particular regulated markets, uh, but um, also it, it shouldn't be a stopper for innovation. For example, let's say a small company has this innovative idea that wants to be um, uh, presented to, in our industry or, or, or in some particular market, but it's taken um, or it's stopped by its bigger uh, competitor. Uh, so regu regulation should uh, lead the way or um, make a way for smaller or innovative concepts to actually uh, enter the market. It's, uh, it shouldn't be the other way around. But this is wishful thinking. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Let's be positive for a little. <laughs> We, are. <laughs> we certainly, excuse me, we certainly see, I mean, you know, crypto does have a, you know, a bit of a shadow that hangs over it and, and, and a bit of a history. And uh, it's, it's interesting, not so much regulation, but certainly on compliance, KYC, AML sides of things, it's the first conversation that we have. You know, there, there's not, you know, that, that, not the, so much the first barrier, but that's absolutely where it starts at. They're, they're very concerned. We get a lot of conversations that uh, compliance isn't, uh, isn't going to support us bringing crypto on board. And you say, oh, what are their concerns? So um, it, it, they just, they're just not happy with it. And they're not clear as to what their actual concerns are. And it, does it sit with that individual or does it sit within you know, the license that they're operating under? Does it sit within the markets that they're, that they're operating in? They're, they're, it's difficult to get that specific out because like anybody who sells a B2B product, it's always easier. You know, a client always loves the fact that they can just say no and move on and, and, and stop that conversation. But if you want to actually overcome that barrier and start having a conversation about how we overcome and what we deliver in terms of KYC and AML and, and, and how we meet their compliance requirements and all of the benefits that we can bring on that side, you're having it with somebody in a department that's not product driven and isn't revenue driven. You know, the, the compliance department is not where you find the, the, the innovation uh, that was raised earlier. So you've, you've, got to, you've got to placate fears. So I think innovation is, is a great way of being able to do that as long as the market itself also has a healthy dose of education going on at the same time about how those innovations benefit the market, how they play within the regulatory framework how they meet, you know, strict KYC and, and AML requirements, et cetera, all, all along that, that, uh, that stretch. But it's, it's uh, I think education and innovation are very, are very key, very much hand in hand. I don't know, Stanislav, are you going to say something? Yeah, I was just trying, trying to relate to an example where innovation could be uh, actually driven by compliance. And I, I could only find innovation, which is done because one has to fit into the compliance rather than uh, otherwise. But one idea- That's very true. Yeah. One, one possible example I can think of is this famous payment, uh, payment provider that is using the uh, European payment directives, which actually was to their advantage. Uh, I'm sure you know who I'm referring to. I mean, that is probably one example of how the innovation came uh, from and not in spite of. And that was great. Otherwise, you usually adapt to it rather than <laughs> vice versa. 
you try to comply. I think I'm already eating a little bit of the time that we should have for the interactions from the audience, but I have one last question for you all. That's just, no I'm, problem. That's no problem. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm just, one, one, one more question just for you guys to, just to tease you a little bit. So if each one of you had to bet, gamble, uh, and we're talking about having something at stake of your own <laughs> in terms of what will be the next breakthrough or what you think will be the next big thing in terms of this industry if you had to say okay if i want i wanted I, I see this as the best as the next big thing in terms of innovation and it doesn't have to be the next big thing it's something you you believe that will be driving the industry in terms of um, something new and something innovative for 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 the next let, let's forget about 2020 for the next year um, and i would like to have just uh, one thought from each one of you you can start wherever you want uh, I'll, I'll start it'll be a mass adoption of of crypto for sure it will be no more a, a need to have it'll be a, a, a for certain and esports i i see that being a a, a tremendous complementary uh, uh complement to the to the gaming side it brings in a, a whole new demographic it's, it's exciting and, and it'll be up to the the operators to find a way of blending that and and turning it into a really compelling product i can totally agree with glenn and that's uh, something more i think that mobile gaming will become uh, more and more uh, used and uh, because it's natural we now spend more time online not only gaming, but um, shopping or just um, buying products uh, and other stuff online. And I think that um, this is going to be developed further over the years um, to come and be used more in the gambling industry as well. To be honest, I'm to our Fixod's product and very, very realistic because we are the first company that offer performance pro for uh, individual athletes. And this is a product that was, you know, proven to, uh, to retail shops also. We are the first company to offer that. And I think that uh, Fantasy, Fixots Fantasy, the next year in the UK and in the US, going to be a blast. I wanted to ask quick about big thoughts and fantasy, but then maybe that's that's separate. Um, as for yeah, that's fantasy, later on. Oh, yes, <laughs> I was wondering if there's an ultimate plan there, because you know every fantasy company is usually has some sort of an idea how to monetize it in real money gaming, or that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, but uh, let's say you know I think that uh, you know when you offer it and you have uh, KPIs from retail shops with total different demographics, like over 40s and it's the only product that you can bet to defenders, midfielders about their performance. I think it's uh, something totally, totally different. And, in, and uh, having in mind that this product respect sportsbook offering, not, you know, try to gain... This complimentary. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is, I think, the big hit because we don't uh, want to take bets. It's special events of, uh, of athletes. And I think that's a total different approach because, you know, um, uh, we are the first one that were licensed because we had our B2C and we're first licensed from the UK Gaming Commission Mother Gaming Authorities back in 2014. And everyone's question was if they're going to, uh, you know, gain money from the sports book. And that's why we have done this approach. Mm. Uh, to answer the question of Vasco, uh, without naming any feature in particular, I think I could name a direction that I believe will, will certainly be important. And it's a direction that is uh, powering your product. Is there anything related to data engineering and data technology? So that is the foundation of any AI or any, and the more of that is, is going to be the, the trend, much more of that. I don't think we're, we're uh, doing data processing in the way that other industries are in real time. So most likely that will be much more prevalent in the gaming industry in the years to come. I'm just missing Norbert right now. I think yes, you're the only one who did say. Uh, if, if, <laughs> if, if, you, if you want me to bet on, on, on one single thing <laughs> in the next year, just in the next year. You can I choose can a couple. Tell you, 
Yes, I can. Uh, from my perspective, it's uh, it's 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 virtual sport. Um, uh, we we saw in our model company, as you might know, our schematic is uh, is uh, is a daughter company of Golden Race. Uh, we saw in our mother company a huge a huge growth in this year. Um, we nearby doubled up. So yes, I think I, I if if I need to predict, if I need to bet on something. It's virtual sports above uh, all the all the before named uh, factors because uh, the players are used to most of these uh, most of these games. Um, if if we are if we will face another another lockdown or something like this, uh, we can we can or or virtual sport can 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 fill at least partly this gap. So okay. that's that's my prediction. Can I ask a question? On the virtual sport? Yes, yes, you can ask whatever you want. For our own business, but um, there's obviously the esports and then there's virtuals, and then there's a crossbreed between them. I mean, there's a bot playing against another bot, uh, let's say FIFA or NBA 2K or, or those. What is anyone's opinion on this? Is that going to work? Because that's a bit new and innovative. Maybe you brought us a, a new idea. No, 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 it's not original, it exists. it exists, there are companies who are offering it. I'm just curious what the audience here thinks about it. You know, is it worth investing in it? Is it worth promoting it? It's worth no. Well, I think everyone is afraid to, 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 to bet on it. No, it, it's, uh, you know, what comes to me and then. I'm I'm the subject of a lot of this uh, because I, I do I do like uh, fantasy sports I do like all the virtual and these sports but I, I think all of this should come naturally that's that's how I see not being a provider of any software I I can say that uh, that's how I see it it's a natural growth and I think that if there's when there's nothing there the market will eventually demand for it and then the product will eventually come 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 to the table so right now i think uh, zoltan if you want to i don't know if you want to, me to keep um no, to keep in, monitoring in the meantime we have some questions coming from the uh from the youtube channel because many have moved over there because i think it must it was much more faster but we also have people here that would most probably like, like to join uh i've sent a question to everyone i think it's how can your product cross-sell to traditional products to increase customer lifetime value? Uh, would any of you would like to take this question? So it's about cross-selling traditional products to increase customer lifetime value. Most probably they mean uh, uh, these new type of virtual, uh, virtual betting and stuff like that add these products to the existing traditional batting and to the existing to the existing products uh, i think some of you already we, spoke about it a little yeah bit. we actually saw it uh, over the past few months that they complement each other very well and uh, for example yeah esports was um, the thing to bet on while traditional sports weren't there uh, but uh, yeah we also heard that when traditional sports uh, return, the interest of esports will decrease, but it's actually uh, not quite um, exact because uh, the increase is still ongoing. We see a lot of interest from players uh, because uh, LAN events uh, like live tournaments of esports were also postponed or, or cancelled. So now, like uh, the biggest tournament of League of Legends, the world actually started and we, we saw a great interest, uh, even not on the main stage of the tournament. So we expect this increase to, uh, to follow and uh, actually COVID accelerated this, uh, this trend for esports. Uh, yeah, Norbert probably will tell more about how Casino uh, is a cross product to, to sports or virtual sports. Yeah. At, uh, at this time, we are working on a very specific, on a very new game, which is, uh, which will be one of these, one of these uh, so-called key drivers. We are working on a, on a cross 
cross uh, cross sell product uh, which uh, combines a slot game with a lottery product. Um, in this game, you can uh, you can you can in a, in a immersive uh, in an immersive uh, lottery studio, you can you can play a slot game, and in this slot game, you can uh, win the highest jackpots ever paid in in the slot history, up to one hundred fifty million and above. Um, we are we are selling in this in this uh, specific game uh, lottery tickets. That means uh, you can you can win out of this out of this game lottery tickets, and these tickets are played directly inside the game. Um, there are a few different options, a few different lotteries, on-demand ones and scheduled ones. Um, this one will be will be our real cross-sell product in the next year. So, if I can add, you know, I think that uh, fantasy, you know, fantasy platforms they can uh, keep the customers. In the website, because uh, you know, if you if you are a customer, you have placed a bet to to your team. You have to go in the website and see how your team is performing. You cannot see the live scores and see how much the the result. So in reality, skill games are keeping the clients in the websites. So after that, you can cross the sell other products of the operator. So what we have to do is keep the customer engaged and on the website. Consequently also with, okay, that, that, that's complementary to sports betting and sports betting to casinos probably in the same way that uh, uh, both are traditional products by now, but mixing them in a certain presentation that allows a non-sports betting customer to cross sell into sports betting uh, is another way of doing that. I mean, in our case, we're offering the, the widgets functionality to casino customers to put that in their casino pages. I guess so, we have a, another yeah. question here. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I can, I'll actually address both of those together in, in one. See, I see the second one is, is for me. Okay. So I'll do, I'll do, I'll do both <laughs> as, as one, as one response. Um, in, 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 you know, targeted off of that first question, it's, it's giving the players what they require. Um, you know, certainly having, Having crypto as, as an, an available deposit and withdrawal method for your players is becoming a necessity in, in many of the most exciting markets that people are moving into. If you look at the, the adoption in, in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, the Latin American countries, Asia, um, you know, if you want to increase your customer's lifetime value, you don't try and pigeonhole their ability to spend money. And, and to be supported in what their requirements are. So saying that you're only going to accept fiat, you're only going to accept credit cards um, is a great position to have, except if you're talking to a market where getting a credit card is, is very difficult, where you know traditional banking is, is uh, there are barriers to traditional banking, where you've got a, a demographic or, or simply a culture where, where crypto adoption is, is high. If they're coming to your casino and you're saying, well, we're not comfortable with doing that, then their players are going to find somewhere else to go. They may be both your, those new players that you're trying to acquire, um, but also in terms of the lifetime value, you're retaining those players who are looking for, you know, they, they've grown and they've got a different way that they would like to be handling their funds. And if you're saying, well, you're not going to support that, then they're going to go and find an operator who can. So you, you've really got to make sure that what you're offering is, is, you know, is adopted to what the, the, the at the minute requirements are of your player basis if you want to retain them as they grow because they will change. And on, on the second one, I think uh, Europe, yes, it's, it's, it's becoming um, increasingly important. Uh, it's certainly important within the gray markets across, across Europe. And we are having some very interesting conversations with operators who are seeing it uh, really overcome some barriers that they have. Um, but certainly in terms of, of, as I mentioned, the companies or the countries before you know, if you're moving into, you know, Africa as a, as a, as a region, if you're going into Asia as a region, you're going across the Latin American countries, you've, you've got to have a, a solid crypto offering that you're, that you're uh, providing your players with the exception of, you know, I mean, Ukraine is the number one in, in Europe, which is a, which is an interesting, an interesting statistic, but in terms of the top 10, it's not, it's not your traditional European countries, but it is absolutely your high growth, very exciting emerging markets where, where it's uh, where it's uh, 
mandatory where it's where it's very uh, important yes it has been a, a an interesting year for everybody and in terms of innovation and uh, possibilities even for business because even us as a as a media and events organizers have had plans for 2021 2022 to extend to new markets and and, and we had this opportunity now to host these virtual events, which gave us access to a much bigger audience, like the one we did with North America, et cetera. And, and all the other event organizers are doing the same thing as, as we see uh, launching in Africa, Asia, stuff like that. So I, I think that uh, this year has been also a good year in terms to focus on uh, projects that you, we may have been stalling for a while, which would have not been uh, accessed because uh, of the long and uh, other processes that we were engaged in. And uh, Vasco, this has been a really, really good discussion. I really loved it. And I think the audience too. And now it's time to give them also the opportunity to give their input. I see uh, Peter has switched on his webcam. Maybe, Peter, you would like to add something to this subject. Yes, hello, everybody. My name is Peter. And actually, I am in the middle of the innovation to innovate the sports betting industry too, with Crypto 2, because I have innovated a five minutes football, soccer, NFL, what was it? and baseball, yes. All, all those sports together into five minutes sequences, which means that the whole game will be only five minutes from the real life and also from virtual. So it, both, both of the things will be good. And I would like to add into the, this thing that actually I have also used a strategy tester for the sports betting industry and Hungary's national gambling company is already testing it out. And when I was at the headquarter, I was very, very surprised that from, from an IT company coming to the government to support the revenue. And they told me that the, the version that I have developed to them actually increases the customer lifetime revenue for them for the future moves and markets. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, somebody else? Would like to add to this subject i see christian anna and somebody from square in the air i think people are starting to become shy or it's becoming uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, too late for everybody okay so uh, with this i would like to of our faces yeah <laughs> uh, I <laughs> With this, I would like to close this uh, day, which has been really interesting for everyone. And uh, thank you for making uh, it really, really interesting, especially since we saw a lot of people uh, staying for this panel. So you guys can give each other a, a virtual clap to thank <laughs> your inputs. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. And uh, have a safe night. <laughs> Thank you, Zoltan. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.